I'll just like wrap um, or something. Yeah. So you want to print or not? I don't think I need to. So the conference is on yeah, you Thursday. Just, if you just go back to the which is Thursday or what is it? Line. It's a Friday. Friday, yeah, next Friday. Friday. I just want to project. Uh, okay, and again uh, to print the poster because yeah, they have a summer the schedule the now, whole so whole you can print content. it from ten to three, and I think. Right there, yeah. and then it should come up. And there. you need to bring it. And Probably there. one hour, at least one okay. hour before 3 p.m. Right. Sorry about that. No problem. Thanks so much. It's yeah, been... you're welcome. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Okay, yep. So, did you start working on your poster? Take it on your own first. Well, I Means have no. some questions. Okay. Well, I you were thinking, kinda but you're not really started. making it. So it's right now, so it's yeah, in there. Okay. Like, so, Alisa, cool. would you please share mm -hmm. the template? Or you can just send it. your poster. But you said it's a wrong size. Mine is the wrong size. So. I can like, they won't extend, like, okay. how's it? No, it's, horizontally or vertically? It's my horizontally, it's too large, like the poster that I have already printed. But I'll email the person and ask her if she wants me to reprint it. Because it's only like a couple inches over. Well, then I don't think it's a Well, inch. I mean, couple as in like, five or six inches over, which is kind of a lot. Yeah, because they want it 40 by 36. Yeah, and I think mine's 46 by 36. Okay. So, I don't know. But you can use, like, Almost. You can use the template in the PowerPoint, right? Then you can adjust the size. Yeah. But you can use your template template in a way how to organize things. Yeah. yeah well. Or if you want, I don't know, Jada, do you have? Do you think you have a good template for the poster? Perfect. Like, <laughs> Somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Just like, like you know. Guitar. I think I saw template, him, not I, really with. I saw uh, him his. working on it. I think he's got the oh, template. Oh, he's had it already. Yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah, okay. like I, 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 I can get some idea. Stuff. I had more questions about like what? specific content. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't like, think he's got an issue with the, the designing it. Yeah. yeah. But but you definitely will put the things on a on a on the iridium and ruthenium complexes which you calculated, right? Uh yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just my, So my, then try to put like you can Put your figures right. You can put titles. Uh, you need methodology. You need introduction, introduction, well, motivation, like methodology. All Thank that you. out and like what I need to put on it. Mm -hmm. If I can figure out like what precisely, what kind of conclusions are you expecting from me? Like, what should I draw conclusions on? Just put all of this stuff, whatever you want, in a, in a one poster, like and then talk with it. her, and then you can add and more, or you like, can. Like, do you want me to do like etios? And again, so we just a second. Um, we need to analyze. Like it's not just to obtain the absorption spectra and compare with experiment. We want to analyze the character of each transition. So right? yeah, the NTOs. So the NTOs is important to show that what type, what nature of each transition, which is not possible to get from experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Not all, of course, but the most important ones. Yeah, sorry, for <laughs> Okay. So it's a literature club, and this is a true literature club. Is uh, describing literature that has been already published. Yeah. <laughs> and whatever. Why is it so dark, dark in there on their side? Um, there will be. There was an original plan for oh, research uh, presentations by uh, Ray and Wade, but uh, for the sake of improving quality of the presentation, it is postponed by about a week. Brilliant, right? Is he there? I can't see anyone except yeah, yellow, yeah. yellow kind of uh, T-shirt from Levi. Yeah, I guess. Okay. <laughs> uh, Brayden is here, yes. <laughs> oh, now I see the shining uh, light from your glasses, probably. <laughs> All right. Oh, well. So, uh, the presentation is by London Johnson, and uh, it will be literature review of published paper on uh, non adiabatic dynamics between titanium dioxide and perovskite. Similar to your own research. Very similar to my research. Okay. Basically the same thing. <laughs> so this is the paper. I sent it out in the email so everybody should have access to the PDF. Um, so this is just an excerpt from the abstract along with a figure that they showed in there. And I didn't plan for this little box being there, of course. Um, 
this, uh, I'm sure everyone in here actually has probably seen a very similar diagram that me and Dimitri put together. Um, this should be the valence band for the perovskite up here, slightly higher than the titanium dioxide. So the idea is you photo excite the perovskite, so it jumps up into the conduction band, and then it will transfer into the conduction band of the titanium dioxide, where it will sit at the band edge, but it will be localized in the titanium dioxide instead of the perovskite. And that's how you get your charge transfer. Um, let's see, I could skim through this real quick. Um, yeah, they end up finding that uh, every mechanism that they look at gives you charge transfer quicker than 100 femtoseconds, so it's ultra fast as they put it. Um, and that you can also, I guess, generate charge transfer from not from right next to the interface, but from deeper in like a bulk perovskite. Um, their simulations, though, deal with a very thin layer of perovskite. So, let's see. But what kind of paper you're reviewing? Did I miss it? Uh, well, I mean, that's, I guess, like, just a citation of it. It's, uh, it's so called, I, like, Ultra Fast. No, just, 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 like, this is a paper you're talking about, yes, right? Yes, this is a paper. So this is also, this is a title, and this is a paper which you are reviewing now, like, yes. which you review. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's just about the, um, the charge transfer across the titanium dioxide perovskite boundary. And specifically, they look at annotase uh, titanium dioxide in a two-dimensional slab. The first question, which I was asking when you were presenting it in the Dimitri's class, right? Why? What's the choice of this? Like, well, why you need to connect perovskites with titanium dioxide? What exactly is the reason for this? What is the motivation for this? Why someone really interested in doing this? So, the idea is you can create something of a charge separation within the perovskite, you can create an exciton at least and separate the charges at least a little bit. Um, the idea is that if you put titanium dioxide next to it, Do it will actually... you excite the perovskite? Yes, you, ex you excite the perovskite. Um, the idea is that if you have titanium but dioxide... But why need to use just perovskite? Again, we know perovskites as bulk materials <laughs> were showing the efficiency for solar cells 20%. It is higher... By themselves, they were? As far as I'm aware, that's only if they're sensitized. I haven't heard anything about strict, like just perovskite hitting 20%. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 2015. But they, they, they yes, Sergei, you're right. they, they, but they interfacing uh, whole transfer layer and electron transfer layer. Well, of course, right. they have some, but. All right, and that's, I guess. And you're optimizing uh, electron transfer layer. Yes, and that's precisely what they're looking at as well. Um, there's just a slightly different perovskite. But again, if I, if, I t if, if, if I take some other structures which are used for the same applications, right, what exactly is the benefits of this? Why is it better? Other structures as in, like, other than the perovskite-based solar cell entirely or, like, other electron transport well, again, structures? Like, or... for example, they use just perovskite bulk material, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, sandwich-like, kind of on the structure of... Uh, uh, another semiconducting, another semiconducting, and then the context, right? Mm -hmm. So why this kind of thing is better? Or you really just making them as quantum dots, like going to the nanostructures, but really thinking about mimicking the processes for these kind of bulk materials? So what I'm doing is not, not you like, doing what they're right, doing. What, what they're doing they probably is should address it, right? Yeah. So that's going to be way up here. I just went in order of the paper with all this. Um, so this is the actual models that they're looking at. So these extend in the like X and Y directions, and then there's a 20 angstrom gap vertically, at least in this picture. So um, they look on the fields. Yes, yeah, they're actually looking at two-dimensional sheets. Um, So the idea is that you can transfer the electron from the perovskite into the titanium dioxide, and then you have a, a, a contact on the other side of the titanium dioxide, and at that point... What about much... hole? What about the hole? It stays on the perovskite, and yes. then directly connected to the contact, which will take out hole? You can do that, um, and this would still be more efficient than if you had just perovskite, but you can increase the efficiency further if you then put a hole transport material on the other side of the perovskite. They're not looking at that. They're explicitly looking at the electron transfer across the titanium dioxide perovskite interface, okay. which is also what I'm looking at. And again, people use just these structures, like 
no no ideas to change the titanium dioxide to something different? Why titanium dioxide? They're they're not necessarily trying to get like an improved efficiency out of what they're doing. They're more so trying to describe in detail what actually happens when the charge is transferred across the interface. So they they mimic things that have been done experimentally a lot and see if they can recreate those numbers, which they do for the most part pretty successfully. Um, the the goal of this paper is to kind of just understand and describe in detail the electron transfer process across okay. this particular interface. In the introduction, they start probably with some experimental papers. Yes. The review where people have this specific setup mm -hmm. for the semiconductor for the for having this titanium dioxide surface kind of uh, layered between uh, between the perovskite and maybe some other semiconducting layer. Yeah, and one of the references and, and, that I was looking at, they kind of just put like a... And they're showing very good efficiency. Uh, what's the reason to... Like, there are millions of different types how you can create the solar cells, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Like, they should be in the paper. I'm 100% sure. Also, I didn't read the paper. I didn't have a chance to look on, on this paper, which you're going to, to, to discuss today. But there should be some reason for us to introduce the, the system and just explain why it's really interesting, important, or what exactly challenges are in this system, right? Mm -hmm. So, could you, could you kind of overview from this point of view before you go into the details what exactly they are starting and so on, right? So just if if they start, my understanding, so they start with saying, oh, these materials were used for for, for the solar cells a lot, and then what? Um, they're showing extremely good efficiency, or they have different numbers for the efficiency depending on uh, different groups who are working. Oh, it's actually what's the challenge there? Both of those things. So they do across the board essentially show very good solar cell efficiency and then very on top of that what? very the high quantum yield essentially how high 100 percent no not 100 percent um i guess that number i couldn't give you off the top of my head um but they the solar cell efficiency ends up getting up to around 20 percent is what the top of the line is okay which is just shy of the traditional silicon, you know, solar cells, which are much more expensive and much more difficult to produce. And? Okay, so okay. this was done. So this material is already showing good good efficiency. Nobody, I guess, really understands why, fully why that is. Why is it so good? Right. Uh -huh. And so that's kind of what this paper is trying so to address. So they're trying to what really specifically go is happening. these computations mm -hmm. to not just uh, kind of uh, to um, how say to support experimental data and get the same whatever rates or something, right? Mm -hmm. So they really just try to see what is special about this interface, which allows what kind of process is really responsible for the charge. And I guess one more thing that I should mention is that the the electron transfer happens so fast that it's actually extremely difficult to determine what is actually happening experimentally. You need ridiculously expensive equipment, and not very many people have access to that. And that still doesn't yield totally detailed. So again, then their main focus just focusing on this specific charge transfer, like really just looking on the charge transfer processes and simulate the charge transfer processes. Yes. So then, because there are many other processes can happen. There can mm -hmm. be a Jerry recombination. There can be uh, just electron hole recombination. The relaxation. What else? Probably <laughs> by exciton formation. There are millions, maybe not millions, but there are many, many, many other processes which may may happen, right? Yes. So, but they focus just on charge transfer. They neglect by anything else, or they look on charge transfer and some other processes which are also competing or maybe helping charge transfer. I don't know. They pretty much exclusively. They, okay, so they look at just charge transfer. They look at three mechanisms by which that can happen, though. Okay, um, so they're really focusing just on charge transfer and yes. trying to figure out which mechanism provides, the most probably provides, the charge transfer state. Yes. So, oh, in, on continuation of this discussion, <laughs> if, if you are so deep, what are the alternative materials that can serve as a electron transferring media? Other than titanium dioxide yes. or other versions of yes. titanium dioxide? Yes, yes, other than titanium dioxide. There were, what was it? Um, Maybe zinc. I can't, yeah, zinc came up 
multiple times and what I've been looking up. Uh, silver, I believe, also came up in one paper that I looked at. Anything organic, like any organic uh, conjugated polymers or there, maybe fullerens? There are liquid electrolyte dyes as well, but those tend to not be very stable long term. They kind of decay and uh, don't work so well after a while. Uh, no electrons, it, I don't huh? No electrons, I don't There's like P, T, 3, something. Yeah, there's like... P3HT. Are these for electrons or like holes? P, Looks like CM or something like that. Like your conjugated well, polymer should be a hole transfer rather mm, than an electron transfer. Well, they, they have different uh, conjugated polymers as electron and hole. Like P3HT so and, 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 and bucky hole. Um, yeah. Uh, John, do you happen to remember? Yes, you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the spiromio tad is another uh, is transport a layer. Transfer. That's a whole transfer. Right. And anything for electron except titanium dioxide. Oh. It's fine if you do not remember now, but it yeah. would be reasonable but... for, to, to remember later. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I want to say there were some chloride based, but I'll have to go back and double check. Okay. That if anyone remembers, good. please email to London because he will need to write um, introduction to his paper and uh, to the poster. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Please keep going. But again, for now, it looks like you can just say, well, you don't care about any other electron transfer or hole transfer materials like these guys do, right? They say, we just want, like, this was shown to work good, and we really want to address the question and answer the question why. Right, With yeah. With this they, specific uh, layer of titanium dioxide and whatever, the paraskizing. Yeah, the reason that they go with this particular configuration is because it's been done so many times Experimental. experimentally, so they can back up and verify what they get and make sure that they're, you know, kind of in the ballpark of what is actually happening. That way they can actually kind of step out of bounds of what re or, uh, experiments have said and say with some degree of confidence, this is what's happening. And again, you're saying, uh, you're saying that, like, for example, to see the, charge the time when the charge transfer happens is very challenging to measure experimentally. But they right. can, that's, and this is one of the reasons why they do it computationally. However, on the other hand, how you can trust your methodology? Like, do they have sh some justification Maybe you will talk about it later, but just kind of again, it should be said in the introduction mm -hmm. somewhere. Uh, what other observables they can compare to experiment as a proof that what they really see is kind of something which we can trust. It's not just some some values which which just appears and we don't know can we really uh, believe uh, that this is true for this methodology or maybe it's really just artifact of the approaches they use. Uh, they do have justifications for the things that they do, and those are included in here. That mostly shows up in the results, so, but so again, that's not until but a little for, while later. But for the justification, again, they compare something with experiment, like what, what, what exactly they do for the justification. Because you can do justification based on the more advanced level of theory mm -hmm. to show that your low level of theory comparable to the higher level of theory, which is, of course, much more trustable. Yeah, or they you do can. That. You can compare with experiments. So they, they just compare it with a higher level theory. Would they do that to justify not including spin orbit coupling in their calculations? Um, but no, no really direct comparison of any observables to experimental data. They do that as well. Um, for, for which observable? Then what, what are the observables? Uh, the normal modes of the titanium dioxide and perovskite, I guess, material in general. When they are connected. Yes. Um, do they compare rates of charge transfer? They do that as well. So it is probably their major observable to compare. It. Yeah, because all the experiments that they quote, they're anywhere from sub 100 femtosecond timescales to uh, up to like sub 2 picosecond timescales. I mean, depending on the experiment, but everything is always less than 2 picoseconds for sure. So to some, uh, to some level, the goal of the paper is to predict rate of charge transfer and justify it versus experimental numbers. Yes. Okay. And before I go there, again, just educational component. So why we start interrupting him and kind of asking all these questions? Because, again, you're writing paper, right? So paper starts with introduction. And introduction, you not just say, like, oh, here is, a here is the materials, so which we want to study and we want to do this and this, right? You really need to explain 
Pretty much answers the same questions as already uh, we, we tried to force <laughs> London to answer. Uh, like, why the choice of this material? What was done experimentally? Like, why the choice of this material? Why the choice of this methodology? Why to do it computationally, right? So when you write your papers, you also have to think about the things, right? And kind of just this discussion about someone else's paper is very, very related to your own discussion with yourself when you start your introduction, especially. Yes. Um, all right, I think I'm gonna move on from the abstract. So the methodology that they follow is uh, pretty standard TDDFT. Um, so the... Again, before going to the details for methodology, so what's like you, you again, dealing with the question about observable. So you already said that they were, uh, first what they do, they use a comparison of the normal modes frequencies with available normal modes known for the systems in That's the That's one of the later things that they do, I guess. Doesn't matter, but this is means it's just a ground state calculations, right? And technically normal modes can be calculated classically without even doing quantum mechanics calculations. But looks like they have to do this normal mode calculations and probably get the ground state. Geometry is a ground state electronic structure. Right? Yes. And then they need to do the dynamics. Right. For the charge and, transfer. Yeah, I have so a So technically the exactly methodology is really kind of has to have both parts. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the way that they wrote the paper is they kind of start with the equations and then they more so explain the actual, the specific details of how they simulated things. Um, so I, I'll just keep going and it'll show up here in a few slides. Um, so the... The electron density is, you know, pretty standard. You just take the uh, the square, I guess, or the inner product of the wave function with itself. Uh, they use the time-dependent Schrodinger wave equation with the cone sham orbitals to get the uh, time dependence, I guess. And then, uh, so the what know, is what is P E subscript? Oh. Um, Oh, this is the older version that I didn't update it. Uh, that means photo excited. That'll show up in a slide or two here. I forgot to, uh, or I missed this one, I guess, when I put this in here. What is it? Photo excited. So, I guess as time goes on, uh, in quantum mechanics, you end up getting these time-dependent expansion coefficients that kind of, they essentially act as weights for how likely you are to find the electron in whichever orbital you're looking at. So this kind of describes how that evolves in the what way What is the difference between your phi and phi, phi tilde. tilde? What tilde stands Where for? Where is it getting this phi tilde? That usually means the Fourier, uh, not what? expansion, um, transform. But in, uh, in this transform? particular paper, they didn't ex they didn't actually say what this comes from, so I'm not entirely sure. What, what, what is um, your vision? But you show an equation and you don't know what is this. For physicists, this is un unforgivable. I, yeah, I, I don't you like it You need to immediately all, blame the authors if you cannot say what it is. Well, right. I, this and is they, what he did, but again, as phys like for chemists, <laughs> we can forgive it, but not for physicists. Well, right. And Transfer to chemistry. I mean, if I... <laughs> Pretend that you're a chemist now. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I'm honestly not totally sure what this is supposed to represent, because usually if you see That's the tilde above it... That's actually why I was starting my question on a previous slide, like... You, they do computations, right? Uh, and you already have this word there, Kansha, more than You that. basically have three symbols of Greek letter phi, mm -hmm. and they may mean different. You, on the previous slide, you have phi sub p. Yep, those are... For ground state? Yeah, those are Kansha orbitals of like a particular energy state. What is Kansha okay. orbitals? How are they getting? How's it getting it? Okay, so they don't mention this in the paper at all. But Do you have it, your own ideas? Yeah, so essentially what it is, is you look at a single electron and pretend that there's no interaction with any other electrons, and you create an orbital out of that. It's kind of a, a mean field approximation. Um, so these aren't really the orbitals, they're... If they do but mean field approximation, so you think they do it through the Hartree Fock approximation? Like they do Hartree Fock calculations to get these orbitals? Or they use different methodology? Uh, Cone Sham is slightly more sophisticated, um, but it's based on that. So which theory is used to get the Cone Sham orbitals? Uh... And how is it more sophisticated than Hartree Fock? 
it takes in an additional consideration over her tree fog. Um, trying to think of exactly what the difference actually is because I haven't looked into that in a while. Do they use density functional theory for this? What's that? Do they get like the name for the theory density functional theory? Is it to get the Kanchan orbitals? Do they, they obtain Kanchan orbitals through the solving? The density, like the equation, yes, which is Kanchan equation, yeah, which is actually called density like functional self, theory, right? Yeah, there's a self So they use the DFT that, approach. They not density functional theory. They not use Hartree fog. They use density functional theory. And he need to declare it, or they need to declare it. And density functional theory is not a mean field theory. Hartree fog, yes, it is, okay. but not not the DFT. So what exactly different between these two theories? Well, I can tell you that hartree fock doesn't use any sort of self-consistent, like a, a multiply iterated self-consistency cycle does. where you, it does. It does. Yes. Oh. Well, then I guess that's out the window. Something different for creating your equation. In hartree fock you solve just really the... The Hamiltonian? Fock operator. Well, yeah. Well, you, you create yeah. your Hamiltonian through the fock or hartree fock uh, uh, matrix, right? And uh, your Hamiltonian includes what terms are included in your Hamiltonian, which is really making it a mean field. Yeah. But what are the terms? Well, of course, you have kinetic energy term, right? In your yep, Hamiltonian. and then you have the potential between the single electron that you're looking at and the uh, the atoms. Okay. okay. You neglect That's any. It? Okay, electron to ion interaction. This is so far folk. We need to no, 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 it's not. It's not Fock. It's the uh, Fock. It will be. Oh, it's, sorry, Hartree. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. wait. It's it's just uh, electron to nuclear interactions. Uh, just electrostatics. Oh. But uh, there is a. It's it's also present in uh, in force field. But what is most challenging for electronic structure at all? The electron electron interactions. Yes. Yes. And what is the similarity or differences between uh, hartree fock and con sham and DFT in taking into account electron electron interaction? Do, do not answer. Oh. Just tell, tell the way how electron electron interaction is taken into account is responsible for differences in these two theories as, as a beginning. Okay. okay. Yeah. So your electron electron interaction again in hartree fock considered it what you call mean field, right? So like you kind of explained, like you can see the one electron orbital kind of interacting in an average field of all other electrons. And for this, you create your potential, mm -hmm. which is your potential from all electrons except one, right? Which acts on the single electron wave function, right? And you after diagonalization, after solving the, uh, the after you diagonalize your Hamiltonian through the solution of uh, the, uh, the just uh, Kansha, uh, not Kansha, the regular equation, which looks pretty much the same as Schrodinger equation, right? Mm -hmm. But now you simplify your term of electron electron interaction, where again you right. have a, but yeah. some effective potential, mm -hmm. which is constructed based on some kind of guess, like they're really just guessing this potential right, in yeah, the beginning, it's, right? Yeah, it's not and then you self consistently accurate. change the potential, which acts now on the single electron function, and also kind of improving both potential and then the wave function. Because you use wave function to create your new potential. Right. And, and, then you and this is your doing also function. in a self-consistent way, pretty much the same as with a, with a DFT, right? Mm -hmm. But in DFT, you're not assuming that you have some effective potential of average potential like directing with a single orbital. You ass you're not assuming, actually, it was proved that you have a density single electron density, yep, which mimics the behavior of many electron Explicitly. density, yeah. right? And then starting with the single density and putting it in a, um, actually it's again, you just need to rewrite the equation, uh, Schrodinger equation in a form of functionals rather than wave functions through this row, mm -hmm. instead of instead of dependence on a wave function, which again, it just, 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 it's the same equation, just kind of presented through the densities, right? And then you start with the idea that your density is a single particle density. But, but it's kind of catching yeah, yeah. the properties of many electron density, 
which actually leads to the appearance again of this electron electron interaction through the uh, exchange um, uh, correlation exchange correlation kind of term mm -hmm. and again this term which we're guessing right yeah that's what the functionals are all trying if to we knew it if we plans. because we don't know exactly how this single density uh, looks like what what exactly is a formula is Yes, this density mainly because of this exchange correlation part is a guessing kinetic term and patent and 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 uh, just column term we know the form this one we don't and this is where we can assume some form right mm -hmm. um, and then solve again self interactively and getting your Kanchan orbitals single particle orbitals which are actually used for constructing the single particle density but if we know this density then we get the exact solution. With right. Hartley Fock, you cannot get the exact solution because you already assume that this is some fake potential, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how does it help, but yeah, but simple way to avoid real, uh, uh, real how say, to, to, to really avoid the real answer would be, yeah, they treat differently the electron-electron interaction. And in one case, you really have this mean field approximation, this is Hartley Fock, where you're assuming that a single particle density interact in an average field, effective potential coming from all other electrons, which of course approximation by definition. In the DFT, it's a theory, it's, it's, it's already proved a theorem showing that you can, if such density exists, that you can actually get all the prop, uh, dense single particle density identical kind of to reproduce the, dense, the properties of the many, body dense, uh, many particle density. So if you know this density, then the solution would be exact. Right, yeah. And this is for DFT, right? And this this kind of very big difference between these two series. And DFT is not the mean field theory. Okay. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, so technically these guys just use density functional theory, not Hartley Fock. Right, yeah. And this phi, phi p ground state densities, uh, ground state uh, wave functions actually just obtained from the density functional calculations. Yes. In the ground state, which we assuming everyone knows how to get it with a with a uh, available software. Yeah. <laughs> so. And then this phi tilde mm -hmm. would be the same Kanchan orbitals which you got from just ground state, right? The only difference is not really kind of optimized densities, uh, but you run the dynamics, right? Mm -hmm nuclear change in their geometry and R big R it's a the, what it's, is your, your it's your P zero zero P zero zero one yeah. house. It's a coordinate of nuclear, right? Right. At each moment of time. Fixed coordinate. Like it's not really variable. It's kind of because you fix the, the position of nuclear, calculate your wave function mm. with a with a DFT. Uh, small r, this is electronic part, the, right. the yeah, coordinate that, that's of the where electron. You're right? Sitting wherever. Yeah. Yeah, so wherever technically, you have at each moment of time, with this specific position of nuclear nucleus, you get in this uh, Kanchan orbitals. So it's this a uh, set of Kanchan orbitals that is varying along the nuclear trajectory. Yeah. So tilde is um, orbitals along the trajectory. Okay. Yeah. That are not that Fourier transform. Well, yeah, it just that's always no, my no, first K is, K is that, just but, I mean, means. that can't be because these aren't the right. K in this case doesn't that. mean momentum. K is just, just the index. It can be J, right. M, right. N, whatever, right? And and your phi uh, tilde is um, wave car old, wave car new that you do not save. You just use them once and then forget. Mm -hmm. But uh, formally, you can tell that it is different set of orbitals at each time step. So technically, you represent your what they call excited state, uh, uh, oh, time dependent, not excited state. Sorry, it's probably not. Uh, I mean, they still kind of assuming probably not really a little whole interaction here for the excitation. But at each moment of time, so they are uh, non-adiabatic wave function represented in a basis of regular adiabatic Kanchan orbitals. Yes. Which is weighted with these coefficients. Mm -hmm. So technically, you don't know these coefficients and. Your next step to know your phi p, you know your phi tilde from, yeah. from solving regular adiabatic uh, solution for the adiabatic uh, equation for the regular DFT kind of uh, approach, right? 
So you need to know your CK, so right. this weighting coefficients, right? Mm -hmm. To to get this uh, non abetic wave function, which you call PE. Right. I mean, with the indexes PE. Yeah. And so I guess I plug this equation into this equation mm -hmm. to figure out C, and that's how they end up. And now you get that. an equation for C only, which again, it's just differential equation. If you can solve it, well, technically you assume that it can be solvable, uh, then you find your C coefficients, right? Right, yes. Again, because it's a differential equation, you need, you need initial conditions. Mm -hmm. Because general solution usually is not really a very valuable solution. So you can solve this equation knowing your initial conditions. That's why, again, for us it's very important to know where you excite, what is your initial conditions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you can solve this equation. And then you know your C at each moment of time, right? You can plug it back to your first equation because you know your phi tilde, you know C after solving this equation, yeah. you, you are done. And what are the terms in these uh, brackets? Uh, epsilon k, d, j, k? So this is the energy, uh, this is a... Energy of what? The where electronic state. And look, they actually, in this case, they have the same k indexes. Your right. phi tilde and this epsilon, are they connected? Yes, this is the energy of this state. Yeah, so actually this is eigenvalue for this eigenfunction. Should it right. depend on time? Well, they get it at this specific moment of time. Yeah, and okay. like, it, it, they will change for different values of time, I guess. But and what well, is then d? Yeah, yeah, that would change. Uh, this d? Mm -hmm. That is the coupling between states J and K. How you, well, looks like we don't know how to get it yet. Next sure slide? That's on the next slide. Right. So this is how you get that D, J, K. Um, so rigorously speaking, this is what that is. Um, what is this little uh, triangle down? <laughs> Just that, in case, explain us. Please. Uh, you should know the name of this operator. I have an operator. What does it mean? It's a little bit different it's than a question. Like a vector spatial derivative. Uh -huh. Derivative of what over what? Over space. It's yeah. like dx by dt, dy by dt, dz by dt. No. Isn't it? Dr. See? It's not. It, it was the right thing to, uh, to ask. It's given their heart. Oh, wait, yeah. Just d over dx, d over yeah, dx. Yeah, this one would be a time over dz. with respect to position. So derivative yeah. of, of which function? Where does it apply to? It will apply to this guy right here. Which we know, what is it? And we... Uh, we all answered this question before. What now? What is your phi, 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 phi tilde? That Sorry. is the state of... Uh, well, it's, it's this guy. This which is right your just Kanshaam orbital. Right. Obtained at um, this specific yeah, moment of time with this so specific it position of nuclei. Primarily, it depends on uh, position of electron, lower case r, and additionally, it is parametrically depending on uppercase r, on position of nuclei. Mm -hmm. So, on your next slide, your triangle down sub r is derivative of Kohn-Sham orbital function over which variable? What are this x, y, z? Like in derivative, what is nominator and what is in denominator? It's derivative of uh, phi tilde over which? Tr? Yes. Yeah, so it's, like it's a big R. Big R is yeah. what? Just oh, your ionic position. Yes. So it is change of nuclear or change of Kohn-Sham orbital in respect to variation of you know, position of ions, right? Yeah. So response of wave function to change of ionic positions. Yes. Right. So it is it is abbreviated here by this triangle down. I should have a more complicated question, and maybe not only to London, but to anyone. So, in a previous slide, we were like, he's having this equation. Well, uh, go, <laughs> go for that. In this equation, right? So, he's having this uh, nabla operator, uh, which would be just derivative with respect to the coordinate x, y, and z for the nuclear position, right? Times dr over dt. Again, big R means only nuclear, uh, the velocity of nuclear. Equals, and then there is something different on the right side. 
just uh, time dependent derivative with respect to the Kanshaw orbital, right? On the uh, applying to the right side and then overlapping with the left uh, with the same Kanshaw orbital, uh, Kanshaw orbital with the different indexes for, for the different state. Um, can you really prove that what you have on the right equals to the, what you have on the left, thinking that your phi tilde has, it's kind of uh, two, uh, how it goes, uh, it depends on two variables, small mm -hmm. r and big r, right? And time, of course. Each right. of them depends on time. So. Right here and right now, probably not. But I do know that the way the Anyone total can? derivatives end up working out, you like get you really need to take a derivative from result. phi, which depends on a small r and big r, each of them also depends on t. Sorry, say that again. Well, you just take derivative from the function phi, yes. which depends on, like phi depends on small r, which also depends on t, and big r, which also depends on t. So, chain rule. so taking, yeah, yeah, chain rule at mine, who was taking the calculus very recently? Alisa! Yeah. Can you? And yeah, what? Take this derivative for the function which depends on two variables. I mean, I, I, I can, but I've she always... She can, she was doing it in front of the class. <laughs> I can, I just, uh, rather not. <laughs> <laughs> can you quickly do it? Maybe. Let's, um, let's try. Then you lift just your little board and show the equation. Well, we See, can look over your so shoulder. That the don't have the issue is that I don't remember for sure how the total derivative goes with respect to like a multivariable function. Chain rule or what do you apply in this case? Chain rule? Do we call it chain rule? Well, I, I guess I don't. I'm just kind of shooting blindly, I guess, but I think that it comes out of. I would, I would think anyway that it would come out of taking the total derivative of the uh, orbital with respect to time. Well, right, again, start with the right side and prove that you will get what you get on the left. What did you roll there? Can you show? Just that so far. Oh, okay. okay. Good, yes. good start. And, and, and don't forget, your, your r is a variable is on a function t. Of t. Yeah. And your big r is also the variable on t. So then you kind of think that one one variable would be not dependent i mean kind of you fix it right the second variable you really take the derivative i just can't remember like where or like how exactly the partials end up playing out in this is just my issue just right try now. something or maybe anyone can have a hint help him how we take these derivatives one over dr times dr over dt one over, wait. The Nabla R is one over dr. So d, d dr. Yeah. So just deep, deep side over d R capital. Are you writing or what? No, 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 no he, I'm just. You can see what he is writing there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So just please write down deep side so over d R capital. D like curly d or straight d. Does matter. Take curly first. Yeah. We can. The amount of errors is much bigger than uh, this little details. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Dr. Not over time. Dr. Oh, of course. And multiply times. Dr. Capital. Over dt. So you can symbolically cross out dr in the first derivative and second, right? Just cross it here and there. Can we have a touch? And, and now show it to all of us. Because I can't see what he's writing there. Ah. Wow. Well, uh, I guess. Once more, I didn't see anything. No, 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 it's no not, I can't. It's, it's too small. small. Just, just, just show, show it. it to us. OK. OK. So. And now look on your left side. Yeah. I mean, in each, on the initial equation which you have on the left side. You're so, saying so on the you, slide there? Or in yeah, you, on the slide. Yeah, it, it is sufficient. So um, You kind of already proved what we asked you to prove. This crossing out is 
to some sort of proofs that is a right uh, um, expression. Because if you cross out this dr on left and uh, on first and second fraction, no. you, you get d but psi over dt. But he, we still don't have any dependence on small r in this case. Right. Well, but technically, again, there, there, you should, can there should be a second, second term. There would be a second term which, which will be derivative on a small r, pretty much the same, right? Yeah. It will be just d psi d small r d small r dt. But we neglect by this term, thinking that this uh, kind of this effect is much less comparing to that. Yeah. Okay. And but everyone does... can see it now. So this number operator is nothing else than just derivative with respect to the big R, right? And then we have this dr dt term as the same, right? And we not really change anything on a side with minus i h and then this uh, uh, how we call it uh, bracket. Uh, Bra, cat, whatever it is, bra or cat, I never remember which one is. Like for uh, cat. Phi, phi j cat, right? So it's kind of staying unchanged either for left or for the right side. So we just kind of reopen this derivative d over dt from psi k as derivative d psi dr times dr dt. And there should be another term for small r which again we just neglect thinking that it's a very small contribution comparing to the uh, nuclear motion. So what London did show on the uh, on well, his little board was that uh, derivative over time is equal to derivative term, over zero, position right? because times just, derivative over, over this time. This is just particularly where you're looking so this should actually go to zero which mm -hmm. would bring that down to zero too mm -hmm. so that should actually Theoretically, zero. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just as a confirmation of your qualification as a physicist, derivative of position over time, how would you call it? Derivative of position of speed? Yes. Speed of what? Oh. It's a big R. Oh, of your uh, actual like molecules, I guess, like your, your atoms. Atoms, atoms yeah. not electrons, right? It's not right. the speed of electrons, it's the speed of nuclei. Yeah. Yes. So the whole thing here is really telling you that you take derivative with respect to the Kansham orbital, which depends on the position of electrons and position of nuclear, right? And this derivative is pretty much the same as if you just take this product between velocity of nuclei, means how quickly they change with time, right? So how quickly they move with time, and the derivative with respect to the nuclear coordinate on an electronic wave function means kind of response how quickly the wave function, electronic wave function, responds on a change in a nuclear position. Like your NABLA operator is really showing you how quickly electronic wave function will be doing something if nuclear already moved, if nuclear already have this velocity. How large this coupling will be if all nuclei have zero velocity? <laughs> it will be zero. Yes. So uh, no motion, no coupling. Right. Oh, you can assume that they move very, very slow. So yeah. not exactly zero, but if if you really have very heavy nucleus, uh, nuclei, then you can kind of again assume that uh, there is almost no effect on the electronic uh, degrees of freedom from nuclear because this term goes to zero and everything goes to zero then, right? But if uh, nuclear degrees of freedom uh, are quantized, even at ground state, there is uh, some uh, non-zero motion as we know at zero kelvin velocity of nucleus equals to zero or not not expectation value of velocity but uh, the uh, mom velocity Moment. squared momentum squared no. again it's a solution of from quantum mechanics harmonic potential, right? Particle in the harmonic potential. So ground, uh, ground, ground state of oscillator uh, has energy one half of uh, h bar omega above zero, right? Yes. Because of the, there are zero, zero uh, uh, point vib vibrations. Right. Okay. So in order to be able to calculate this whole deal on the computer, they essentially take this derivative and discretize it like this. Mm -hmm. And now, Again, can you give some ideas, just mathematically, why the derivative with time can be considered as uh, this uh, difference? 
And so, why it's an approximated sign here? So if you have like a, let's say like a one-dimensional function, the derivative would give you the slope of that function, uh -huh. which is like how much your your y value is changing with respect to your x value. Okay. So this is kind of the difference between your you, y value. Do you know the name of this approximation? Like how, like how you go from derivative to this difference, it has a special name. It calls Newton's difference. Oh, I think I've heard that before, I guess. Just and of course, you can actually go to much more complicated formula for, mm -hmm. for approximate your derivative. Uh, wrong you could, wrong you could, no, no, something, in, in something else, kind of including higher order terms. Now, the question is why we need this approximation? Because computers are not capable of handling continuity. Yeah, so you need kind of discretize because right. we, we do with computers like this in a discrete space. Right, that's, yeah, they store That's the only reason why so you kind of using like this formula. Yeah. If, if, it, if it would be easy to take this uh, partial or kind of derivatives uh, in a continuous space, right, then we don't need, like, we are done. Right. And this is really just for uh, computational, how to say, for, for programming. Exactly, yeah. Like if you then, really want I to mean, write a program, how to take these derivatives, then you go this way. Exactly, yeah, because computers have to store everything in discrete bits, so you have to have discrete yeah. things to calculate with. And again, this is not a very accurate way to, to get the derivatives. There are much more, more accurate way to do it. Accurate means at any time, but this yeah. is the simplest and uh, the easiest way to get these derivatives. Correct. In the discrete space. That's right. Good. Okay, we finally really know what is non-abetic couplings and how they are calculated, not only in this paper, but in the things which you are doing with uh, our approaches to non-abetic dynamics. So, okay, so they're going to talk about localization, I guess. Um, so the way that they figure out, you know, how much, how much of the electron is on the perovskite or the titanium dioxide is they uh, take an integral well, okay. So, so the theoretically, thing you take an um, electron transfer reaction coordinate, right? Do they speak this language? Uh, I don't think. What does it they mean do integral? And then, yeah. like, 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 what what actually these uh, notations under the integration mean? Right here. Yeah. This is uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide, which I think I actually had to think about earlier somewhere. Yeah. So it, they write it in this paper like this. I've seen it. Probably more but when they say like integral that. and then this thing, what exactly does this mean? So, what that would mean, somewhere... How do they really do this integral? <laughs> so, essentially what that means is that here's your perovskite up here, here's your titanium dioxide. Mm -hmm. They take the integral of your electron density, but only in this region of space. You don't take the integral Only in the coordinates corresponding to the position of perovskite. Right. And then they probably can do the same for titanium dioxide, take in co integrate exactly. over yeah. the coordinates, but only for the positions of the, of, the, of, the, of the titanium dioxide. Right. And because in this case, the system is really having this layer, kind of layer geometry, so it's very easy to separate one from the other just along the z axis, actually. Correct, yeah. Um, so, okay, right here. So, they take the integral over the, you know, the perovskite or the titanium dioxide. I think they just do this and then take one minus it for the titanium dioxide. Um, so you want to integrate your electron density to figure out, you know, how much of the electron is on the um, perovskite. And so this is just equal to the... Um, and then they just kind of apply the previous formulas which were written for exactly. this density as right. a square of the... Uh, how say non-abetic wave function, which is was constructed as a weight coefficient times Kansham exactly. uh, adiabatic yeah. orbitals, and this is how you get to the last line in right. this equation. Yeah, so you have your wave function times its complex conjugate, so you get both of those terms. Yeah. And because it's squares, that's why it's a conjugate like conjugate uh, product. Right, and then you get those guys. So, um, so if you take this and take the time derivative of it then you end up uh, getting these two terms. And this I don't understand particularly well. Um, why, why do you decide that they take time de derivative, derivative with respect to time? Looks That's like they integrate it, huh? Oh, no, 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 they take the derivative yeah. of that integral. integral. Okay. So first they find this integral and then they take a derivative. Yes, but with a different variable. Um, so 
I mean, I, I can see how it breaks into this. I guess I'm just not really totally sure. Why just, just, uh, just explain how it breaks and, and how would you interpret it? So, uh, this would be the chain rule, essentially. Okay. Um, so you take the time derivative with respect to this time-dependent part. So which would be uh, occupation number? Yes. Okay. Actually, this weight coefficients have a meaning Ex also of occupation number of state k at Expansion coefficient t. squared is, is occupation number. Right. Of the yeah. state k at whatever moment of time. Okay. Right. So you take the time derivative of this part, leave this part intact, uh -huh. and then you add that to leaving this part intact and taking the time derivative of this part. Okay. And so that's what you have right here. Uh, you got the time derivative with respect to your expansion coefficients, and that gives you your non-adiabatic electron transfer. And then the other term gives you your adiabatic electron so transfer. One so contrib one contribution uh, originates from changing the occupations of orbitals. Yes. And another uh, coming from changing of the spatial shape of orbitals. Mm -hmm. Yes. And change of occupations occurs only if, uh, if you have non-adiabaticity, if one jumps from one orbital to another. And change of the shape of orbitals can happen anyway, even in ground state, as in the uh, MDPL method uh, programmed and designed by John and recently MDPL? practiced by... Yes, molecular dynamics photoluminescence. Ah practiced by uh, everyone else. So that's actually a nice segue into this next thing. At least I think this is what it's going to be. So I was really confused about this right away. Um, and we were actually, you guys just explained like why this should be the way that now it is. Now you're not confused anymore. No, no, not anymore. Now it's actually good before we got here. But I, so originally I kind of read this as like, well, OK, the, you know, you have adiabatic changes induced by the nuclear motion, which seems wrong to me, and then your non-adiabatic changes don't have anything to do with nuclear motion. So that just seemed kind of backwards to me. But if you go back again to the exactly, previous right. slide. Yeah, and that's exactly what this is saying right and here. Everyone, no questions on this? Looks good. Um, so let's see. So they also kind of say that, you know, if you've got a strong coupling that your photo excitation can directly promote it from a donor to an acceptor state, um, which would correspond to a direct electron transfer. But if, I, I guess my issue with this is that and if you have- And what is a donor and what is accepting in this case? Uh, they give a picture of- It was your first picture. Here we go. So this would be like the donor state where it starts out, and then it will transfer over to this state. So this would be the acceptor state. So you'd have, you know, your coupling kind of coming from these little guys. And again, right top is your perovskite, right? Correct. So I guess the idea is that you excite probably perovskite. Right. And and then just accuse here that they have the hybridized orbital. Why? Yeah. How do they interpret? Well, it? maybe maybe they interpret it later. We are kind of but. But, but again, so this is your initial conditions. Where you excite? You, what is your donor? Mm -hmm. So you excite the perovskite, and then if there is a charge transfer, then accept, acceptor takes this electron state, right? And then electron should appear to, to the titanium dioxide. Right. And in their case, yeah, so they kind of excite really hybridized states. It's both titanium and this one, but Rel relatively. Relatively. The yeah, acceptor I mean, state has much more charge density on, a on titanium dioxide exactly, yeah. than on uh, perovskite. Yeah, yeah, acceptor yeah, on it, a titanium. It ends up more on the titanium dioxide than it was originally, but it kind of was on both to begin with, so you're not really transferring but, the charge. But why is already start with this hybridizer? They probably have some discussion, and you can probably Yeah, yeah they do uh, I mean, after you talk some about that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. To me, I mean, that just doesn't really seem like an actual transfer necessarily. I mean, it's just kind of like a hand wavy. You know, it's more on the titanium dioxide now. Um, I, I guess that's kind of my issue with that. Um, and then this part, uh, what was it? So, yeah, th this part kind of, to me, seems to contradict this part in blue. Uh, read it or explain it by your own words. Do not expect us to be Greek readers. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, okay, so they claim that the non-adiabatic electron transfer operates when the, the coupling is weak, but the non-adiabatic transfer happens when it transfers states, which would imply that you would want a strong coupling for that, if it's actually changing from one state to another. You don't accept the coupling here. It's a complete kind of, you can also call it, it's just electronic coupling between mm -hmm. orbital 100% localized on a donor and 100% localized on an electron, or on an on acceptor, right? So like you really see, in other words, a kind of overlap between electronic orbitals, one sitting on one part of the system and the other on completely different, uh, spatially different part of the system, right? And again, if they really localized, if it's pure charge transfer state, 100%, that's why I say 100% localized on your titanium, one another 100% localized on a uh, perovskite. Then it's 100% charge transfer state, mm -hmm. right? And electronic coupling between such states, especially because they're so different spatially, of course, the coupling donor acceptor coupling would be weak. So you think that they're just talking about like but, the, the but first to the last orbitals? They will be weak, so the mechanism of, of this charge transfer state is not really through the donor acceptor interaction. This is, I translate what they exactly say. So they just trying to say, I, I just rephrase it. So if the donor acceptor coupling is weak, right? So then it's not, not really something which really provides you this charge transfer, charge transfer state. Then the only thing which is responsible for the charge transfer state would be non-adiabatic uh, couplings. Like the term, the first part of this one would be really contributing to this formation of the charge transfer state. If the donor acceptor couplings are strong, then it probably means that it's not 100% pure charge transfer. It would be kind of hybridized states initially, like something was already showing there. there, there was yeah. ambigu... Then the mechanism of formation Ambiguity of the charge transfer state the, is slightly different. the verbalization, how they, they uh, express it here. Right. The, word, the meaning on, of word coupling changes from sentence to sentence. It seems like... Yeah. That, that, uh, uh, yeah. Um, in, in your uh, green highlighted, mm -hmm. Donor acceptor coupling uh, correlated to direct electron transfer mechanism. Uh, here, the coupling deals with uh, mixing of orbitals. Right, yeah, like how much they overlap. Yes, yeah. and uh, radiative non zero transition dipole. Yes, dipole. Which means uh, because direct, we talk about excited state. direct electron transfer, which means that without any non adiabaticity, just photo exciting from uh, ground to excited state, you simultaneously promote some redistribution in space. It is what is called direct but electron transfer. Can we return back to your slide with uh, this uh, adiabatic non adiabatic couplings? No, no, formulas uh, for, yeah, for, oh, no, next one. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, you kind of can, like, if you look on the adiabatic part, right, you can kind of already see that this integral, right, mm -hmm. have this uh, product between your function i and function j, right? right? Um, and you can uh, suppose that if your function j is, com and you integrate over, and o over the coordinates which belongs to the, to the space corresponding right, yeah, to, to the yeah. acceptor or donor, doesn't matter, like only one mm -hmm. part of this. So if you're assuming that your psi j is completely, is on the other side of the molecule, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, that this term becomes negligible because this integration will go to zero or something like this, like very small. Um, if you have really, like if you already have hybridized orbitals, which again, kind of this overlap between your i and j, between your donor and acceptor states. So then, of course, this integral should have some large meaning. The value would be definitely much larger than zero if they have this overlap right away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's kind of, again, looking on this formula, it also belongs to the, like how, we, how they put these formulas into the words. Like if they have this adiabatic term large, then they should have large overlap between psi i and psi j. And if it's a charge transfer state, you expect that i would be sitting on one side, on a donor, j would be on acceptor or backward. And this overlap, of course, if, it, if they completely sit one there, one there, the overlap would be small, but if they have some hybridization portion, right, some kind of 
a little bit there, a little bit there, okay, spread over the both. Then, of course, this, the, the more they spread, the more electronically they coupled, which again, electronic coupling is similar to the hybridization idea, right? So the more they hybridize, the more they are kind of electronically coupled, don't accept it. So the larger this uh, integral would be just, just looking at this formula. And yeah, and because you integrate over the space, you kind of expect that there should be some contribute, like, they sh you should have some dipole moment there, which also will yeah. contribute for transition dipole because you have different states here. Right. So, I guess that makes a little bit more sense now. Um, so, more methods. This is how they end up figuring out the, uh, the phonon modes. Um, and again, I'm not totally sure what they're trying to get at because they say that these brackets are um, canonical averaging. It's favorite subject of Levi. <laughs> You may ask him to give so, a comment. So, like, I, I'm not sure what this subscript T is supposed to be then at that point. They never specify. And temperature, then this... temperature, temperature. Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I figured. But So it's a canonical, uh, canonical whatever they call it, uh, ensemble. So the average over the... It's not an ensemble averaging, it's canonical averaging. At, at temperature... Canonical temperature? ensemble? <laughs> it's the same as canonical ensemble. Yeah, it's the same Statistical word. mechanics? I guess that's not what I interpreted canonical averaging as. Huh? That's not what I interpreted canonical okay. averaging as. <laughs> so how do you interpret it? Uh, you have like all your different values that you got, you sum those up, and then you divide it by the total number of values. That you so like. just integration over time? With different values of t? No. No, no, no. <laughs> or, it's or canonical just... ensemble. They average okay. over ensemble. Right? That makes more sense, yeah. And again, you get this contribution of ensembles because you're not looking on a zero temperature. You're looking on a whatever temperature, room temperature, thousand Kelvin. I don't know what like you can consider it at any temperature, fine temperature, higher than zero temperature, right? So that's why you kind of construct your canonical ensemble based on this temperature, and okay. uh, average over this ensemble how many how many structures you consider this ensemble. Okay. So then, is this just multiplication happening here, or like what's no, what's actually happening inside of the averaging? For each, uh, for ten, that doesn't make sense to me, but I don't know what else that's supposed to be then. Well, E0, this is your initial conditions at moment zero. Right, yeah, that's your initial energy. Right? This is your energy at whatever time. And this time. is at any moment like, of time, right? What do you so do with them you kind of it? multiply your E0 on a E of any moment of time, right? Averaging over ensemble at this specific temperature. So if you have several uh, ensembles, and each ensemble experiences trajectory from zero to t. You would uh, add together this product for each member of, of uh, ensemble. Uh, for for like for, you. For so this is multiplication. It's a multiplication. Well, multiplication then you but have then a product together of many of them. Of right. Yeah. No. I, for each I ensemble, for for each terms of the in, in ensemble, then like your average means you have like these brackets means that you sum over uh, each of these see, guys. See, is, is the drawing ensemble. something. Levi, please draw it with bigger, we uh, see bigger size. Use the whole amplitude from the top to the bottom of the of the board. Right. Or zoom in. Oh, or the, this also might work if you put excellent. it higher. <laughs> excellent. Good. Maybe too much. You can now reduce it. Good. Uh, uh, too much. Perfect. Stop. So, all, from what I've heard from Oleg's group and what I've read through his papers, because his papers are kind of vague, you have autocorrelation functions of all your arrays, right? So, I mean, uh, all your uh, ensembles. So, like, this could be time zero through n. <laughs> and this one is time one through n plus one where n is your number of time steps in your uh, non adiabatic trajectory, right? So, unless this is different than most of his, you have uh, long ground state dynamics, and you chop that up into different sections, and then you do your electronic dynamics on top of that, and all you do is you compute these things, and then you do 
you divide by um, the number after adding them. Yeah. So then, yeah, yeah, they, they you do that, you'll get like this. That's, huh? They they do normalize. That's the next thing. If that's what you. Yeah. They, they, there's there's two. There's the autocorrelation and the normalized autocorrelation. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is still before normalization. So divide. This is not normalized. Yes. Okay. Yeah. When I did this, I had a confusion here. Why they multiplied with E naught at the time T? Yeah, equals. that's kind of what I'm wondering. It's initial. Because, uh, it, it just a that is the, It's their way of saying to do the autocorrelation function. So you have your energy. So. But E naught is a constant, right? If we multiply by a constant, no. only finally it didn't. It's, it's constant. I guess there's different temperatures. It's constant so at it specific, for a specific ensemble, specific ensemble, right? Ensemble. For another, you take another representative of ensemble, it mm -hmm. has a different E naught. And another would be a different E naught, yeah. right? So it's not really constant. It's yeah, I actually on, calculated through if, this. You one. can think yeah. if you take a trajectory at the first 300, mm -hmm. then it would depend on temperature, or on temperature and time. Or you can think that your first 300 so, is your ensemble. Okay. So it depends on the number if of your ensemble. Is your, I mean, one, two, three. If this is your E naught, right? How do you do an autocorrelation function? You take the initial time, you multiply them all together, and you add them. Then you shift the function by one, you do the same until you have the last number Available. multiplied by the first. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah? Yes. So if, if we do this, it is very logical to assume that the first value in your autocorrelation function is the largest. So if you do E0 yep. times e zero that's this value then you say e one times e zero and that's the next one and you, and you, and you just follow time. levi levi this is you follow the red curve first right like yeah you, your first two steps right. along the, the red curve then you have to do the yes. same for the blue curve and yes. as many and each of these colored curves it's your contribution of different ensembles Yes. So you have to do the autocorrelation function for the energy for each um, time, which is why they do E naught times E of T. So they leave one function static and they just move the other function. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Levi. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, so I think we move on with that. Um, so this is just some stuff that they claim about the autocorrelation functions. I haven't really done much with them, so uh, I don't. And this is explain this normalized. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So they take, you know, whatever they got, and they divide that by the initial. Now the well, average of ensemble. This is also average. But this is now energy of initial at, oh, at wait, no, for each cool. ensemble at the initial moment of time, right? So they can, in other words, you find your average energy, average initial energy, well, squared. Right, yeah. So, I mean, no. this would keep your value between 1 and negative 1, no. just depending on your sign. No, so E right. squared means that you just take the value at, so if you multiply all of the energies and sum them, that's E squared. Right, but those are the largest values that show up in any given temperature, right? But they're not, this yeah. is now yeah, constant. I mean, this is, normalizing this it, is so not dependent on, te on time. This is just a more. constant, right? So it's taken only the initial yeah, so moment of time. It's just a constant. Yes. So, uh, so, right, so if this is the largest value that ever shows up in any of these then we and technically they actually explain why they do this normalization right because if you don't do this normalization that your c at zero time like this your after correlation uh, function at zero time should give you really this averaged squared energy initial mo uh, energy of at the initial moment right uh, like by its right. initial value c of not like this is this is a formula in the first uh, line after the formula right like if you don't divide by this term, that your initial C 
at t equals zero, right, will give will give you this value e square naught average of ensemble. Now, if you normalize it, that your initial will be equal to one, and this is the largest right. possible value to to be reached in the after correlation function. Right. Yeah. So it's just kind of a way of yeah. comparing it to itself, which is what you're doing with the auto correlation function anyway. So kind of makes sense to go that way with it. Um, so they do this with uh, energy and with localization. Um, what? They do it. They do what? They find the they, they take the function, function. Yeah. So they for energy, and they also do it for what? The localization. So instead of energies here, you have the localization. Oh, this uh, regional oh. coordinate of charge transfer. Yeah. Okay. That'll show what? up later. Red shifted what? Oh, reaction coordinates, yes. So then after they do that, uh, they take Fourier transforms of those, and they use that to identify phonon modes, essentially. Uh-huh. Yeah. So technically, they're not really looking for the normal modes. Not necessarily that those things which they found is really the normal mode. Do you, know, do you see the difference? What so do we call I, I don't a normal mode? Exactly what do we call a normal mode? Means. Before we go there, what do we call a normal mode? It would be like a, I don't know, like the natural way for the phonons to be vibrating, well, not phonons to be vibrating, but the atoms to be vibrating, sort of like a, a resonant yeah. frequency. So you can also think again, if you consider your system is solid, right? So it's a kind of, you know, just uh, lattice vibrations, right? So you can really represent it as a particle in a harmonic potential. Particle in this case, not electro electron. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, that case. Okay, run that by me one more time. You just need to solve the particle in the harmonic potential. And the solution of this will give you the frequencies of each of the vibrations. Oh, Whereas yeah, a yeah, particle, okay. it's actually a, it's, it's a particle, which means it's a kind of effective mass of entire system, right? Mm -hmm. So the, how's it called, a reduced mass of the, how many atoms you have in your calculation cell, right? Mm -hmm. So you will get then normal modes, which already assumed to be harmonic. I guess I'm not aware of normal modes that aren't harmonic. Ha -ha, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you cannot get like if you have unharmonicity, they are not like you. They are not really called normal modes. Right. You will have how they call it uh, 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 response, not response, zero order response, second order response, or something like this. So if everything is harmonic, then normal modes would perfectly and adequately represent any possible atomic motions. Right. But if there is an unharmonicity, your you need to atoms, correct your normal mode uh, solution. May perform more complicated motions. Right. And it is what typically occurs at larger temperatures. Mm -hmm. If the temperature is too high, then bonds it's, are broken it's and it's just yeah. translational. Can you improve oh, can anyone prove very simple proof? Why if we increase in the temperature, why the motion of uh, nuclear are not any more close to the harmonic potential? And why at zero Kelvin, you really can assume that your motion of nuclei is really c kind of like same as a motion in the harmonic potential. But you can well, just consider two, like two, the atom of two, how to call it, the molecule of two atoms, for example. What would be the form of the potential? Really? So what is your x and y axis in this case? So what happens with the potential? Well, when one atom starts going far, 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 like look, look this is a this is a vibrational motion. One, look, mm -hmm. you move your like, this is the oscillate, right? Right. Yeah. But technically, what if what happens with your potential if you put your atoms very far away from each other? Oh wait a minute, hold on. And what if you put them really kind of bad. one to each other? Huh? I can see actually anything. Yeah, it's kind of Use bad. black. Use black. Do we have a better marker? Yeah, it's a Anyone remembers the name of such potential? For the start with, molecule? Start with L? Yes. Uh, depends, well. <laughs> huh? Morse potential? Morse potential, Morse, yeah. Yes, there is a... Leonard Jones, I guess, yeah. also it's another alternative for pretty much the same thing. Leonard Jones frequency. Wait, it'd be a Leonard Jones potential? 
Is it? What would be your potential when atoms come oh, close yeah, to each other? Yeah, Are they allowed yeah, to be yeah, close yeah, to each yeah, other? Yeah. So not too close, no. Not too close. If they really want to so take the okay. same position, right? Then, but then energy, potential energy, should increase drastically, so goes to infinity. And if they far away, then your potential wants to go to zero. And they have minimal, the optimal, when they are at equilibrium, right? When they are in the right distance, kind of. In optimal parallel to x axis. Um, so this would be like zero then, right here, somewhere. So it'd be something more like that. Then. Yeah. Well, yes. it goes to zero, right? Yeah, um, yeah, where it kind of trails off. Well, and again, I the think kind of this curve <laughs> might be it's exponentially going to zero, or might have some bump. It, it's yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah this is the and this is the equilibrium point, right? Yeah. So this is exactly where we are at zero Kelvin. Now, can you look and kind of approximate this near the zero if you're really close to this uh, minima? How does the potential look like? It would look like a like your first draft. Harmonic potential, yeah. Just <laughs> like a parabola, right? Yeah. But if you, but when you go to higher temperatures, you get more kinetic energy. The atoms can go far away from each other than right, they are yeah, initially, they right? The so they can actually reach the kind of ranges really far away from this equilibrium point. And right. then their potential is not is not parabolic anymore. Yeah, then it would... Yeah, and then again, and this is means that your normal modes, which are just solution of the harmonic potential kind of solution, right, will be outside this approximation and you need to correct it through the unharmonistic terms. Mm -hmm. So the higher the temperature, uh, the less valid is harmonic approximation. The less they really will be like normal modes. Right, yeah. Now, if you kind of think about your dynamics, I mean, not your dynamics, uh, your dynamics as well for your systems, but in this paper, they definitely do it not at zero Kelvin. They do dynamics at which temperature? 300 Kelvin. Room temp oh, round yeah. room temperature, 300 Kelvin. So which means you already... you. 300 Kelvin is probably still supposed to be close to equilibrium in these systems, right? But but maybe there is some already kind of tendency to to gum outside a little bit, right? Right. Yeah. So and actually they do this procedure what they do, right? So first of all, they find the not normal modes but actual because it's already includes like if if it's not harmonic, it's already there like their uh, motion of nuclear. Probably not harmonic, but wherever, wherever the motion at 300 Kelvin, mm -hmm. because they do it as it is supposed to be done through the through the DFT and through the regular whatever forces uh, for how say classical force kind of approach to the nuclear motion, right? Technically, it can be not harmonic. There are no any approximation saying that your system at this 300 Kelvin really behaves harmonically. Right. So first, they not really find a normal mode. They found actual frequencies, actual frequencies for this motion, which is correlates uh, to this temperature. Second, they found only frequencies of those vibrations which are coupled to this electronic degrees of freedom, to those energies which were like I J indexes, which you had, well, kind of Levi had in his in his draft mm. uh, when you go in, right? right? Which contribute, which contribute. Uh, to this E, which they really consider for this uh, um, after correlation functions, right? Because they're not some of these energies all over all states. They really specify specific states which they consider. Yes. When they construct this correl uh, after correlation function. Right. So it means they find the frequencies only coupled to this electronic degrees of freedom. And plus, it's not really normal modes because again, normal modes corresponds to the only harmonic uh, solution. They found actual frequencies of whatever motion of nu nu nuclear nu nuclei at this temperature, mm -hmm. which of course you can connect it to normal modes. But what they yeah. do not really find in the normal modes, right? Because yeah. finding the normal modes, you would first of all think that you do everything at zero Kelvin, right? And then you really just solve the uh, particle in the harmonic potential with whatever mass corresponding to the actual system, um, reduced mass of whatever, or effective mass for, for, for the system which you are considering. Which again, you also can do with DFT calculations, right? Right, yeah, that's like the next step in my research actually, is to get those. But this would be very different from what right, they yeah, found, yeah. oh, I mean, some of frequencies might be very close to those frequencies found from the Fourier transform of this after correlation function. But but if you just find all normal modes, right? So 
it's kind of infrared spectra, right, at zero Kelvin. And of course, what you can find from this method is slightly different. Mm -hmm. Physical meaning is the same, but technical kind of features a little bit different. So first of all, they are not harmonic. Uh, there are some harmonicity included. And second, it's only the frequencies which are coupled to these specific energies which are contributing when you construct your uh, after-correlation function. Means for these specific states. Right, yeah. So, um, I guess some details about the cells that they're actually simulating. Um, they, okay, so it's, it repeats in like the X and the Y directions, I guess. So it's, you know, planar, uh, what do they got? 20 angstroms, I believe, vertically between um, one cell and the next. Uh, anything else that's important, really? Yeah, I think that's most of the important stuff. Unless anybody wants to talk about anything. No, so just briefly summarize, like, okay. do they have more than one K point? They didn't mention K points. Means they, they there is nothing to brag about. <laughs> yeah. Probably it's just gamma point, okay. So, um, this is kind of some of the details of how they handled everything. They used BASP, uh, they used a PBE uh, functional, and they used a GG, or wait. So immediately, when you look on this uh, kind of description, do you expect that whatever the energies they found, especially if they look on the optical transitions, right, means from occupied to unoccupied state, do you expect that this would be something really comparable to real experimental systems or not? As far as I know, um, these at least get you pretty close with perovskites. Uh, with semiconductors, they definitely don't. They so it's known that you just use regular GJ functionals and the optical transitions, the optical gaps are very close to what is exp what is seen in experiment. With is it true? Perovskites, I believe that is it's it pretty true? close. So, like, you really don't need to go to the hybrid functional, so anything more advanced with perovskites? <laughs> there is a conservation of errors. If you go to hybrid functionals, you need to take into account uh, spin orbit, spin orbit, and maybe accidents. Ah. But if you do neither one of these advanced uh, calculations, you get approximately the right value. Okay. Just by so again, you get right value for the wrong reason, right? Yeah. Be careful. Again, as as theoreticians, even getting the same number as an experiment doesn't really, like I said, like we usually compare with experiment, but not necessarily. It would be really saying that the method is really accurate. It just like in this case, it looks like it's a consolation error. Mm -hmm. To be accurate, you need to include both the excitonic effects. The probably also improve your G uh, functional. With uh, for the exchange part, with putting like hybrid functionals or GW correction, which is pretty much the same, and uh, but then you also need to include the spin orbit, mm -hmm. and then if you do everything accurately, you will get the energy gaps, which actually can be reproduced by PBE, but again PBE reproducing it for the wrong reason, it's just because it makes it really smaller, but. In real systems, it's smaller because of contribution of other terms which uh, you have to include when you improve your functional. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So okay. So they yeah. So they're using PBE and GGA and you know project, projected augmented wave uh, method, standard VASP stuff, and then they they ignore spin orbit coupling because they were able to find and some what other results. And uh, what like what for this? Uh, this uh, the projector argument wave method is used. It has. Oh God, I would have to look at it again because I never really fully understood exactly what it does. But it's it doing of... something with valence electrons, right? And core uh, electrons, am I right? Yes. It... So, so what we do usually with core electrons? Should we really include them in the same level as uh, valence electrons? So we can. We can do some tricks. How many? This would be the tricks. London, um, <laughs> uh, when you create a model mm -hmm. and then explore the number of um, ions and the number of electrons in the model, would the number of electrons in the model correspond to number of electrons that you would uh, compute from periodic table? No. So how many electrons are in carbon when you do VASP calculation? According to us. According to us, yes. Periodic table. Um, 
Just in six. You, you, huh? six. Six in periodic table. And when you make a simulation cell with just one carbon atom and count number of electrons. John is prompting you. Would it be four then? <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to remember where exactly it lies on the periodic table. So what happens with this other two electrons? They're core electrons, so they're the kind S1S of... uh, electrons, right? Yeah. Two electrons on the one S orbital, which you can treat as core electrons. Yeah. Okay. So so technically there is a trick, uh, which again, we you can also call it a pseudo-potential uh, yeah. for not really actually calculating in a DFT type of kind of calculations as we usually do for valence electrons. You just kind of feed it with some function, supposing that this function is known, right? right? And, it, and this saves a lot of computational time. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, for carbon, two electrons, not a big deal. But if you go to really have like elements lead, like I lead, have, right, yeah. then you really have a huge number of core electrons and you save enormously saving the time for your calculations mm -hmm. without really losing a huge, uh, I mean, pretty much with the same accuracy, mm -hmm. hopefully. The same. Well, yeah. But yeah, I know that this does that. I just can't, like, I know it goes like reciprocal space and then back to regular space and that. I just don't know the details. Um, I don't know why that little thing is right there either. It's kind of weird. Um, so yeah, they, they neglect spin orbit coupling because they were able to find experimental results and uh, non-spin orbit calculate calculations that agree with each other reasonably well. And so, we already know that it just was the wrong reason, okay? Yeah, but it's, if it's accurate enough, then they can save a little bit of computational time. So this is how they actually perform the molecular dynamics and everything. Um, I mean, pretty standard procedure as far as I'm aware. I, I don't know of anybody doing it really differently, I guess. Um, they do geometry optimization at zero Kelvin, and then they gradually heat it up 300K, and then they do molecular dynamics at that point for three picoseconds uh, with one So how many, uh, how big is the canonic ensemble? And it's written there. Uh, Not really saying that this is a... Oh, you're asking like how many samples? Yeah. yeah. So this is 500 samples, mm -hmm. randomly chosen from three per second. Actually, this is the number of, uh, how say, uh, and, um, each each term of the ensemble, which contributes to this average and when you construct the um, after correlation function. Right, yeah. Okay. yeah. So parentheses, These... which you average, actually going through this 500... Uh, initially chopped out kind of uh, pieces from your three pico uh, trajectory, which means your trajectory is not three pico second now, but two and half, two pico second, uh, two thousand, uh, two pico second and 500, right? Because 500 were taken from this trajectory to the considered as ensemble for averaging of ensemble. Probably so, actually less because they do it randomly. If they took first 500, then it would be definitely two point f uh, two two and a half picoseconds for the length of the trajectory which they can run uh, with their calculations. Does that make sense? So, okay, I, I guess I'm not sure that that's what they're doing. So I got have a three picosecond trajectory. This? Well, again, with random, it's a little bit ambiguous. But you're taking your three picosecond trajectory. Yep. And then you take in 500, first 500, kind of thinking that this is your ensemble, which means like, again, you go from zero to 2.500 picosecond for the first ensemble okay. term. Then you kind of take in the second one. So it goes from second to 250, 2.501, right? And then kind of each, like, you remember, how Levi was drawing this red and blue yep. trajectories, right? Yeah. So the length of this each traje trajectory is now two point, uh, how do you say, two point five hundred picosecond. Uh, I well, so okay, so I two point five. They actually, they, they, I think what they do is they just take five hundred random things and then they do kind of a separate MD on those. Because mm. um, down here, what they say is that they then take an electron and place it into a photo excited state. And that ends up being tracked by the time-dependent cone sham equations. Okay. So I, that's how I understood that, I guess. No, no. Okay. It would be kind of enormously too much to do it. Like you, you can imagine, right? So like think you were doing these calculations already. Mm -hmm. Things that you now, like if you take, it's really like, first of all, you need to create 500 uh, initial states. Mm -hmm. You need 500 geometries. Where are you getting it? So From your MD run. Right. So you need to run your MD run first. 
And then you say that you take, okay. like, first, like you can do it. You can, you can run UMD runs and randomly choose 500 configurations and then run simultaneously 500 jobs mm -hmm. on the C cast or whatever you calculate it, right? Each with as long as you can for, for each of them running it. It's computationally it be too much very work. rigorous. Right. A reviewer would love it, <laughs> but, but it would be like... Oh, you can just run, you can, you can just run your MD for three picoseconds mm -hmm. and then kind of reserve 500, kind of thinking that you have really kind of shifting them, each of them one by one, and so, so you do it 500 times. Okay. Uh, from from one trajectory which you already calculated during your MD run. But this, this and, is not and, rigorous. It is call, approximation. It's approximation which is called ergo. It's based on ergodic hypothesis that you may have heard in statistical mechanics. That average over ensemble is equal to average over, over time. time. Or trajectory. Ergodicity theorem or something like this. Okay. And this helps of course to save a lot of resources. Yeah. And this is a way how we do it. The only thing when they say random, I guess... V not means really those who practice surface hopping. I guess they're not really doing it randomly, and this random is... Because again, if they do it randomly, You'd have it's really not place. defined how many... Oh, oh, let's say, then you can reserve... Like, to do it randomly with 500 uh, reserved ensembles, right, different types of ensembles, from 3 per second, technically you can do it. You say, okay, I'm now reserving 1,000, so means my dynamics is done just for two picosecond. My trajectory, really actual trajectory in each ensemble, will have only two picosecond uh, lengths, right? And then from the thousand, I randomly choose first five, uh, not first, like randomly choose 500, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, <laughs> from thousand first, you get random 500 with uh, total trajectory not longer than two picosecond. Make sense or not? The yes. Initial condition randomly. Um. It doesn't make any sense. What is so, the no, initial conditions randomly? No, from, from the 3, 000, uh, three picosecond trajectory, they select uh, randomly 500. If you select randomly five, okay, you have three picosecond tra trajectory. Randomly, your one of these uh, things goes to four, uh, oh, not four, two point seventy nine picosecond. Yeah, so then your trajectory is just a couple of femtosecond, yeah. uh, like hundreds of femtoseconds. In ensemble, there's a 500 conditions now. So now they're going to the 500. You will. Day. Then how long your trajectory for will be if you do it really randomly? Am I the only one who understands this or not? Should we really discuss it? Can I then draw something? No, the, no, no. Oh, what? The, the white The green one works decently in there, the black one doesn't work so well. Doesn't work at all. The yeah. green also doesn't work. The green, green works work. all right on that one. Okay, can I ask them for green? This on the other black. side. Oh. Or at least it was for me the little bit that I used it. The word random is very confusing. Right. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe they so, mean that they start this the is my first random, trajectory. Right? This is my Not another like random. First mm -hmm. Then offset this is my initial offset condition. Offset then this is my trajectory. So offset now my trajectory 10, has 50, only 5, 400 so offset. Femme per second lengths. Yeah, this trajectory will have something around 2.5 picosecond because this guy is around 500. Uh, from the second initially, right? Mm -hmm. So if I really do it randomly, that I will have very different pieces of trajectories, and and then then I will have wrong uh, wrong values just because because I need to choose this ensemble to have mm -hmm. exactly the same lengths for trajectories. So that's why I'm saying randomly can be done if you choose up to one picosecond, right, from this three picosecond, and then you randomly choose the conditions here. Then your dynamics like each of these trajectories, because any of them will be less, oh, less or e larger or equal than 2,000 mm -hmm. femtoseconds, two picoseconds, right? I, I assume indeed like this, was, was like this is the trajectory and they got randomly from here. But this is exactly the problem. It, no, I'm not. The new trajectory no, not having enough time. I was like from the, this five, they got an ensemble of these five different conditions now. 
Now they they applying this initial condition here according to this whole trajectory. You can't. This does no, make sense I mean, because this is not initial anymore. Like it doesn't make any sense. Like you cannot you cannot do it this way. How you're saying? No, I because mean, you change. <laughs> no, I'm just saying we can take suppose like these five states from these five different uh, uh, trajectory or we can take five initial five no you can't because your trajectories would be different if this is your initial condition this is your trajectory if this is your initial condition this is your initial trajectory then you have to choose the trajectory length being the smallest right so if you take this one then you really can go further not further than 100 from the second all of them then you like you really have to have 500 with this small amount of uh, trajectories for very short period for your dynamics. Yeah, so now, the yeah. space where you choose your random should be smaller, uh, not smaller, uh, well, depends again how long you want to take this trajectory, but you n really need to correlate the, uh, how to say, the space of the entire trajectory versus your final goal for how long your trajectory should be, mm. right? And then you really have to define your window where you choose your random, because if you take the entire thing as a random, then you might have cases where your trajectory would be extremely small. And then you either take them out, right? And the, actually you end, but if you take anything which is uh, kind of give you less than, let's say, this amount, mm -hmm. right, you end up with pretty much the same idea. You either take the first 500 or you randomly take 500 from the first 800 or from the first 1,000 or from the first mm -hmm. 2,000 and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So you really need to specify your window here, which would be smaller than so the I, entire this window. this is what you're talking about, right? Yes, like, yes, correct. So they could... I guess take like different points that you know say that they run the actual electronic like excited state calculation for like 500 femtoseconds so they could start here excite the electron and then use the rest of the MD trajectory yes. like that and then they could also have like a separate um condition run yeah whatever a separate initial condition to run that for 500 femtoseconds with the most opti optically active transition starting here mm -hmm. I guess so this is how I'm understanding this now. No, no, but this 500 stays not for the length of the trajectory. This oh, oh, yeah, no, no, that, that, that was just a random. This could be like 700 or whatever. Well, That's, but this exactly yeah. is the point, yeah. If you randomly, like, you have three picosecond, you randomly choose 500, right? Mm -hmm. You need to kind of specify your initial window where you can take this 500, because if you take it from all three picosecond, you end up with trajectories being too small comparing to the other trajectories. But I guess as long as you run the trajectories, like w once you pick a point, as long as you run these trajectories for the same amount of time every time, I guess I don't see why there should be an issue. Because you can, let's say, if you take your initial condition here, oh, right, this is it's random. It can be happening here. Yeah. You will not have your 500 femtosecond in this case. Oh, right. Yeah, sense, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's so what, then you okay. have to drop this point out. Yeah. If yeah. your trajectory less, let's say you want to do it for 500 femtoseconds. Yeah. And your random then guy appears at the very end. This is exactly what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay. 2,999 yeah. femtosecond. So you have really one femtosecond left mm -hmm. for, for, for the rest of your trajectory. Right. This doesn't make any sense yeah, to do, right? That, so it yes. cannot be considered as initial condition. So you have to drop this out. And then if you kind of use simple math, you will figure out that. You cannot take your random numbers from anything, like if you want to hold your 500 mm -hmm. uh, uh, picoseconds, then yeah, you, you, you probably need to take 2,000 uh, femtosecond window where you're taking your random and saving 1,000 for, for length of trajectory. Right. Or 500, and then you can yeah. go 2,500 for initial uh, random choice. Yes, I completely agree okay. with that. Yeah. But if they take randomly, then like if they take first, first 500, then the trajectory will be not longer than 2.5 uh, 2 uh, picosecond, 2,500 femtosecond, if they take five initial, 500 initial conditions. If they take it randomly, then again, the trajectory would be less than 2.5, mm -hmm. and probably south at, at maybe 1,000, maybe even less than 1,000, right? Mm -hmm. Because many points then have to be taken out since their trajectory would be smaller than, than they probably desired. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, are we okay. agreeing on it or not? Or you still have some other ideas on it? Um, 
Maybe I need to take Who's like, that he, more. He, he's not convinced yet. Okay, but we have to move. Okay. okay. Next time, Jabot will present. We will. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> interview him on this aspect. But no, 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 no. No, we just can give it yeah, to you. Talk choose with, yeah, random talk conditions for your mm. step three and see how this goes. Like choose your conditions as many like wherever your trajectory is available, mm. right? Try to play with this initial conditions like in a random way and see what happens hopping. and how long you can do it. And so, so, okay, is this surface hopping? Yeah, is that what this is? Okay. Well, um, they do everything for surface hopping, but in this paper they decline to do the uh, last step of, of surface hopping. But and then they cannot change all, all of their machinery, they just for it. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. uh, this struck me as being very similar to surface hopping, but I, I don't know surface hopping well enough to say if this actually is or not. I, I don't know your opinion. Maybe you'll share it. Uh, why they do not practice actual surface hopping? I, in, in well, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it didn't give their reliable results and they decided to decline. Maybe it doesn't help to practice equations six and seven. Oh, so you can. I'm not sure. The only thing is. So we are almost done with methods, and we have another hour for results and discussion. Yeah, yeah, an hour? Well, we, we will be cut off at, yeah, at no, six. Oh, okay. I reserved uh, another hour and because we are going to go And you can create a game. Your Next time we need to bring. <laughs> 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 I can't, and I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? That's my, my cutoff. I have to leave before then because I'm having something picking up. So I have to go. I have five minutes. So. But sure, it is. It will be recorded. You, you will be able to enjoy it. You will not miss it. Don't worry. It <laughs> <laughs> only starting now. We are going to results and discussion. That's right. <laughs> so, um, I guess I don't know for sure what I want to say about this one. So, what are the results? Um. So. Well, they took something about direct photo, uh, direct photo excitation mechanism. Yeah, so this, I mean, they're kind of talking about that direct mechanism here. Um, Which so means you already have this charge transfer state just from the photo excitation, right? Right, yeah. Okay, can I make a brief, brief comment? Mm -hmm. Just as a um, suggestion for everyone and criticism to this slide. Uh, everyone is expected to start preparing posters. There will be schedule how we present them uh, here, but plan to have some draft coming Tuesday. When doing presentations orally or in posters, typically there is no space oh. to give just to give detailed uh, sentences. Uh, it is important skill to learn how to convert continuous text into chopped sentence chopped. Uh, Bullet words, kind of style. bullet uh, style, and return back if you develop something in chopped bullet style back into continuous text. I just want to comment also, there was someone habit in my group, people start putting figure captions in their posters, and again, this is probably not the best way to do it, because your caption will take probably much more space, rather than you really put it like a bullet for uh, main main conclusions regarding these re results, right? You don't need really to, because you will be standing near your poster and explaining each figure. So you probably don't need really a caption as we do for papers, because they really take much more space rather than just valid kind of things, just discuss what exactly, like the title of your figure and what the main uh, observations are there. And same probably in this case, because in your presentation, no one has enough time to go through this caption figure. You're, you're twisting arms of uh, me as a uh, audience of your talk to, to read all this. But what if I'm illiterate or even <laughs> lazy to read? Well, <laughs> see, the issue is that there's a lot with this paper that I wasn't totally sure I understood correctly, so I just wanted to use direct quotes from the paper. OK. But generally, it's uh, more standard to do short about style. Yeah. Um, and again, you can just put it like on the top, like charge density distribution, right? And then you kind of say A initial, B final. Or whatever. Or whatever, Don't whatever this yeah, A yeah, yeah, stays for. Just, yeah. just, just above the, like just inside, mm -hmm. in, insert to the, to the figures, and then you again don't need anything on the figure three. Right. Or, or in addition to figure three, those who really want more details can read your text. Those who don't, they see immediately what this figure shows. Yeah. So. But again, the main conclusion of this figure. I Basically guess this hybridization, the, right? Yeah, the, the direct 
um, <coughs> what am I trying to say? The direct electron transfer process contributes like 50%. Maybe not the the processes, total. but just a charge transfer state. Because it is... It's not really a process. You shine light and it's immediately there. When your excitation consists of A as a uh, hole, where electron is withdrawn from, and B as a uh, conduction when where electron is promoted to, then excitation made of this uh, pair of orbitals will be charge transfer excitation. Yeah. Immediately. So it's not really a process. It just happens at once. Yeah, they. I don't know. They kind that's, of. That's what they call direct photo excitation. Right means. But they they use this as like a starting point later, to then further describe like the actual charge transfer. So mm -hmm. I guess I, I don't know. I'm kind of I guess hesitant well, to. Again. Say that you know it's already transferred. It's probably by this not point. equally distributed. It's not like fifty fifty. It's probably more on that side, less on that side. Right? Probably it's more on titanium <laughs> dioxide, or maybe more on perovskite. Hard to say, but uh, from this figure, but. Yeah, it's not like 50-50, half there, half there. There are some That's small details, they and they probably want kind of to figure out, yeah, so where does it move? But the final state looks like really just majority comes from titanium dioxide. Right. Um, you end up with big contribution on, uh, on your titanium, or, or on a perovskite where you excite, right? And then end up with really mainly coming on the titanium dioxide. So, more details now on the uh, processes through the dynamics, right? right. Next result. Yeah, the, so I don't know, they, what is it, they, they basically say that it's, I guess it's kind of blocked by this thing probably. Um, but they, you see it in the printout. Yeah, they, they claim that it's unexpected that the, uh, that the acceptor state would be mostly localized on the titanium uh, dioxide since the, um, well, see, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, though. I don't know anything about that. Oh, never mind. No, what they're saying is that it's unexpected that you would have density on the perovskite here, since the first states in the conduction band would be localized on the titanium dioxide. But they don't actually tell you what orbitals these are, so I, but, I don't but even where know. Where they put like excite? Like if you go to the doors next. Most week, likely it's homo lumen. Where do they excite? Homo lumen or where? I, well, they don't say. But then they look on the dynamics from where to where, from homo to luma. So it's a recombination, or they have non-radiative uh, relaxation from some higher, deeper electron state to the to the luma. So what they do is they take the highest. Um, oscillator strength, and then they use that as their. And they don't tell where this highest oscillator strength appears. No, they don't. They don't say at and all. They don't like show what any of these are. Spectrum. No. So we don't know where exactly they excite. No. At which energy was it? Small zero. They, they don't mention anything. Close of that. to the band gap, not close to the band gap. We don't. I would assume. Well, okay, it's somewhat close to the band gap. They keep it within 0.25 eV <laughs> above it. Oh, so it looks like they excite you know. somewhere. Not maybe not exactly to Luma. But, but close, like, to, close to it, yeah. But then, probably relaxation happens exactly to Luma, and this Luma is titanium dioxide state. So uh, it's, it's well, independent wait, 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 relaxation. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, it's not homo and Luma. It's pro something like maybe. It's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, it's intraband relaxation. Both are I mean, unoccupied. Uh, yes, it could be like yes, like minus three Luma plus five or something like that. Luma, Luma plus I five think and both Luma are plus unoccupied. Both Luma. electronic states. No, no. Both, both, both belongs to conduction band. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Both. One is occupied, another is unoccupied. I mean, his donor and yes. acceptor means is electron going from this to there. So because they what is they all an electron kind only of. Only about electron transfer. They don't care about all. I and doubt that this is occupied. It would be reasonable to I start with like Luma plus 10 and look how it would uh, Go cascade to Luma. To Luma. Yes. Mm -hmm. So don't and accept they, a not in the sense yes. that you it's a donor acceptor from the like anything in the paper that would yeah, donor accept accept that initially the donor mm -hmm. final, yeah, final acceptor yeah. but again final after relaxation mm -hmm. they excited to the band gap to 0.25 electron volt above it above to the gap above to 2.5 sorry 0.25 electron volt above the band gap 
about okay so they kind of go deeper to the this was kind of talking about this figure so if they're talking about a direct charge transfer mechanism then the photo excitation should be coming from the conduction band to the va yeah, sorry, from the valence band to the conduction band. Is the initial band. Yes. But they probably that, that don't talk, talk but they're not talking about photo excitation. Donor and acceptor of electron because the put it in a title that it is means a white board. Interesting. This one works better. Oh, it is something like that an initial state and final state of electron? I would say they are both electron. Yeah. How much? 1.5 above the point, point two five. five electron volt. Above point the two five electron volt. Okay, I guess this is kind of and this is uh, this is E. You can show it to other people. <laughs> Dimitri is already working on that. <laughs> yeah, something like this. So the big arrow shows the excitation. So we don't know exactly where, right? But they excited above the luma by or, or higher than band gap by about O25. So it's really probably excited somewhere close to Homa and somewhere not very far away from luma with a difference in energy of about O25 above the gap, right? And those state where they initially excite, this is our A case. They show in this, uh, this uh, orbital where they excite with the highest occupation, uh, highest oscillator strings, mm -hmm. has this form of A. But after the dual dynamics, right? So they end up to Luma, and Luma is now mainly coming from a titanium dioxide. So, mm, which means after the relaxation, right? So they kind of have this charge transfer state from perovskite to the titanium dioxide. And then from titanium dioxide, it should go to the to the to the leads, right? To the metallic contacts. Yeah. And again, we don't care about holes, so that's why holes are completely unknown story here. They're not even discuss it, right? They care only about electrons. That's right. why it's everything about the conduction band. Yeah. So both donor and acceptor are in the conduction band electronic states. Agree? I just, I'm confused about what they're talking about with the direct mechanism then, because that doesn't make any sense to me if that's how they're doing this. Direct mechanism because you, you already kind of go to the state when you excite your A case, having already charge yeah. transfer character, which means okay. you, ju you just excite oh, and you already yeah, yeah. have then, a charge transfer. Please keep, hold, please, keep, please keep holding, <laughs> keep holding it here. So it could be excitation either this way or this way. So it, um, excitation from to intermediately optically active and then cascading down, or it can be immediately excitation to final charge transfer state. And maybe this would be, they would call it uh, direct and indirect. Okay, this is a similar question you got in the mm, last semester final presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm how this charge is transparent. So again, when you read the papers, so your purpose not only to understand what's going on, but you probably can also kind of decide to yourself that how really they're good in explaining things, in presenting yeah. the things, how they're good to, you have uh, right to, to be able to repeat, like for example, you are a student, you want just to repeat exactly the same calculations. Just reading this paper, are you able to do it? No. They might have supplemental materials, by the way. They do, yeah. And maybe it's if just you read it carefully, yeah, many many <laughs> things would be there, no? Not many. Yeah. For this paper, things. not many. Not many, but... but yeah, it's, it's just one, paper, one figure. Who is the author? Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So... Okay, so this claim, I don't know, just kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit, I guess, but maybe that makes more sense now. Um, so what they say is that about half of the photo-excited electron is delocalized onto the slab, which indicates that the direct mechanism is responsible for half of the overall injection. That just kind of doesn't seem to logically follow for me, I guess. Um, but I think... I, I think that they're referring to a more specific thing, but they're using kind of general language, which is why I'm having an issue with it. Um, 
Because they do later on... Oh, yeah, right here, actually. I think what they're trying to say is that basically... They're using this as like a 50%, I guess, of the overall transition. Um, so... But localization where? What do you mean by localization? Like on the perovskite or on the die. So but this figure is showing... Oops, this figure is showing... Yeah, localization on the perovskite. Let's say 50 means 50 on the perovskite, 50 on the titanium. But exactly. 55, 55 on the perovskite. And yes. 45 on the titanium. Correct. Um, so, yeah, and they, they end up getting a you know similar band gap to what was shown experimentally and uh, with previous DFT calculations, just as kind of verification. Um, so for the simple thing that we all would understand, can you comment on the density of states and how to interpret it? Uh, so here's your band gap right here. Um, mm -hmm. They centered the zero on the Fermi level. Mm -hmm. um, so the red line is your methyl ammonium perovskite. Uh, the black line is representing titanium dioxide. And I'm colorblind, sorry. Okay, yeah, so... Basically, you have, you know, these two different densities of states, I guess. So you kind of have your, your perovskite has a higher valence band edge than the titanium dioxide does. But the, the titanium dioxide the conference. has a lower conduction band edge than the perovskite does. So this is kind of the situation that you want. This is so again, if you want to excite the perovskite, Right, so then you can go really from Homa or close to Homa mm -hmm. to not, but not to Luma because Luma would be completely charged transfer state, which probably is not optically active. Right. So you need to go a little bit above, and that's why the yeah, it's or twenty five above probably okay. where you have contribution of the. Perovskite. What is the nature of the lowest excitation based on this density of states? Charge transfer character. <laughs> would you agree? Yes. Of the lowest, not excitation, but lowest transition. Lowest uh, possible transition. Lowest excite, not protest, like fo not photo excitation, but lowest possible excited state. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, the lowest possible excited state would definitely be a charge transfer. Okay. Because it would be, it would start localized on the um, perovskite and end up localized on the titanium dioxide. Why red one is times five? I'm not. Is it X? I guess it's I, I think times they five. Just do that just to kind of make it more visually but apparent. But exaggerate for visualization. Yeah. Times five, both sides, valence and conduction band are multiplied by five. No. I guess. No, I, only, you know, only valence. Because, because times five is red color. Yeah, yeah. Red that, color, yeah. But he's also red. What do you mean? Yeah. I mean, valence and conduction band both are multiplied by five. No, only contribution I, from perovskite is multiplied. <laughs> Yeah. But both on the poles and electrons, yes. right? Oh, okay. So if they don't multiply by five, you definitely will see this contribution in a uh, valence band for the holes, right? Uh, for the occupied states. But then uh, imagine the red curve divided by five, five mm -hmm. times smaller. You will be almost impossible to see any contribution in the unoccupied state in a uh, in a conduction band. So I guess the multiply five is really due to the purpose to. Kind of to show the contribution in the unoccupied levels for the electronic states, right? Yeah, rather than sense. whole states. Holes will be seen anyway. But then, how they got the initial donor one is a 50 50 now? Because so they excite, well, we don't know where they excite. Yeah, right? but it still seems like it should be to the title. Well, for so density of states, yeah. this big peak doesn't mean that you have one orbital with all this localization on the titanium. Mm. It's many of them, maybe with whatever. No, okay. And how does this state shown here correlates to what you were calculating? Is there similarities or differences? Just quickly. Uh, the structure of like the edges of the bands is the same as what I'm. Well, the same in at least one of the situations is what I'm doing. So it favors uh, charge transfer as the lowest excited state. Correct. Good. Um, so on this figure, this black line represents the density of states, and these little red dots represent uh, the localization of a particular excitation. So like an excitation at whatever energy ends up localizing it, you know, yay much on the perovskite. Yeah, so you the, one to what? Titanium dioxide? the density of states. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't know, I've never seen that, I guess. And so I don't know exactly how to keep those numbers. I, I don't know how to go from like these numbers to these numbers. I guess, I guess the energy is like 
exactly at two. This is where they probably like two point two probably corresponds to the two point two on the left 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 uh, figure, right? And then you're yes. density going yes. up and then okay, going yes. down. You kind of can see like black curve going so up. So X and, and Y, uh, the right side of the Y corresponds to the red density of states. Yes. Yeah, we, it's because uh, it's like, is measured is one over electron volt in both uh, panels. Oh, right. So black line is the density. Oh, of yeah, yeah, because it would be density between the energies yeah. and and sky. I do not understand this very well. Oh, black line. Yeah, they are saying that this interface. I mean, <laughs> in the top. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> we even didn't start the dynamics thing. <laughs> okay, let's go to the dynamics. Whatever is wait, they wait, see wait, on wait. this. Just, just keep, keep going what you were planning. Okay. Um. Then I'm leaving. Because we're already here two hours and of questions. 15 minutes. And answers. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, they basically claim that. This the previous figure justifies that they're you know within reasonable parameters you know so that they can actually describe electron dynamics hopefully with some accuracy. Um, they say that the red dots uh, there's no correlation between the, um, the the localization and the energy of the excitation. Um, it just varies around 0.5, which is I think why they're trying to say that it's 50% of the overall charge transfer. Um, they correlate the uh, the dip in the density of states things to something. Um, moving on. Okay. So here's where they do the Fourier transforms of the autocorrelation functions. These are the Fourier transforms. These are the autocorrelation functions. Um, so they find a lot of um, uh, phonon modes, I guess, of some sort, not ser not necessarily normal, in you know these regions right here, and they attribute those to a bunch of them that were found experimentally. That's pretty much all that this whole slide is. Um, so these and are what, normal what, modes. What, that what found, exactly? Normal modes. What kind of motion of atom? What type of atoms are involved in this uh, big peaks around? Uh, less than two hundred. Uh, so they okay. So they get more specific with that over here. I guess they they so attribute like this two hundred peak to one thing. You know which oh. one? Um, you, you want us to read it, or you can? Guide us. Guide us. You read it by yourself already. Well, I I don't remember numbers and things like I yeah. So I'd have to read it again. again that's but. why you need to do ballots. Then this would be very easy. Even if you no. don't remember, you immediately can say, oh, this frequency is that. Labels the figure with arrows. Tell no. me which. Um. So we see like less stretch yeah. is 94 wave numbers, right? We go to higher, then what is it? Uh, that starts to go to the oxygens, I believe. Okay, it should to be figured out later. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Uh, this is just more of that stuff, I guess. Just attributing certain things to, or certain things to certain atoms. Um, come on. Okay, this is best figure of the whole paper, main figure, I would say. So this is a schematic that they make, kind of explaining the different charge transfer mechanisms. Um, so the direct one, see, and this is why I guess I was thinking that the, that that uh, donor one was in the valence band, because that's kind of what this suggests to me. Mm -hmm. um, but then, okay, so if you excite it, then you uh, have, you know, a non-adiabatic thing where it just kind of dips down to a different state, or you have the adiabatic transition where it, you know, kind of gets over the energy barrier and ends up in the titanium dioxide. Um, so they use that initial excitation having 50% localization on the titanium dioxide as a starting point for the total charge transfer, and then the adiabatic and non-adiabatic, they start at zero, so they just add these two to 50%, uh, and that's how they get this curve. Um, 
I don't know if there's really a whole lot else that I want to say about this, I guess. But again, uh, analysis of these dashed and dotted lines. Like, first of all, again, the time scale really for very short time, 100 frames a second. Yeah, but they end up having a total charge transfer within that 100 femtoseconds. Mm -hmm. So, and then, so it's really probably we're doing random uh, kind of choice of this uh, 500 samples from 3 picoseconds because it looks like they don't really need to go beyond 100 femtoseconds. So, really need right. to have a very short trajectory. Yeah, and uh, the, this is averaged, I guess I should mention too. Um, okay. And uh, then, uh, which have the largest contribution, non-adiabatic or uh, adiabatic? What, what do you adiabatic think? usually have the the largest and the quickest contribution, but the non-adiabatic still results Wait, in a fast transition. Wait, 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 wait. The uh, color is like... Okay. Yeah. Not at one, non-adiabatic. Yeah, the rest this is non-adiabatic. Non this one is adiabatic. So the largest contribution comes from adiabatic, again, Correct. through the electronic usually. couplings. Yeah. Not usually, this is their data. This is the average of all 500. Right. Some of the usually means for this system, usually among their data. You, you yeah, usually yeah, it doesn't apply to yeah, not any system in the world. Not wound up with faster adiabatic transitions. Mm -hmm. it, they did have How, some And again, them. you kind of expect it because they're already showing that there is a big contribution of these hybridized orbitals. Right. Which means that adiabatic couplings would be... Dominant. Kind yeah. of, well, definitely should play a significant role, and it does, yeah. right? Um. So, how is the uh, rate of this sub, whatever, 50, 40 femtosecond correspond to what you were computing by your methods? GPCC. Uh, like the with... rates of charge transfer from perovskite to titanium dioxide in your calculations. Oh. They... Were they short, quicker? Oh, mine were a little bit longer than this, but not by much, because mine were, you know, pretty much 100 femtoseconds anyway. Okay. So mine agreed pretty well with this. Okay. Or at least the ones that I've done so far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they they basically claim that you know the non-adiabatic happens in more systems because you don't require as much coupling, but the adiabatic um, would usually go quicker if that is an option. Uh, they used by exponential line to fit it. So, okay, so these are all different particular uh, initial conditions that they chose and ran with. And so they, I think that they're just kind of trying to show that it can go sort of any way where you have adiabatic dominating and non adiabatic essentially. But how does this initial condition is different? Like, what exactly is the difference between each of these cases? They don't say. It should be in the captions, I guess. They they just say that you have more adiabatic than non adiabatic, more non adiabatic than adiabatic, kind of equal and oscillating adiabatic, and then uh, just like a super quick charge transfer. That's all they really say. So you can control the mechanism by changing initial conditions. Yeah. No, oh, this is not initial. It's individual electron transfer. What's that? Individual one, not uh, any in different initial conditions. This is an example of four different electron transfer. Oh, before but the each different, each, each different average. starting point. It's not average. It's just an example of a specific one. Event, After averaging, they behave like your yeah. first graph. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Graph. They, they, yeah. They average five hundred of these to get that other. But they just took a few from this ensemble yeah, for example, yeah. and right. see, yeah, the, seen how much they're really different and we can see, yeah, they're different, wow. Right. Wow. <laughs> um, hey, yeah, right. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so these are kind of the main conclusions that I think that they drew out of here. Um, Finally, we have bullets. <laughs> So they... But there will be three pages of bullets. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried to condense it as much as I could while including the important issue stuff. <laughs> so um, they basically say that they generated a detailed understanding of the electron transfer dynamics, which I kind of disagree with because they didn't really give any details. They just kind of said that like these mechanisms happen, <laughs> which, duh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they found that it works on a sub-100 femtosecond time scale. Um, if you do the excitation 
near the Which interface, again, you have a very high probability. Uh, hundred, sub 100 femtosecond, this is what was seen also in experiments, right? Kind yes, of. with the ones that were able to measure down to that time scale, yeah, they usually found that it's like 100 femtoseconds or less than Well, that. again, in experiments, they probably cannot ta tell exactly how long it takes. Well, right. But they yeah. probably can say not longer than. Right, and that's how most of them. 100 femtoseconds. Right. 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 You know, yeah. It, the, very fast though, like the longest one was less than two picoseconds, and I imagine that's just because they don't have the resolution to go down farther than that. Um, so, uh, yeah, just multiple mechanisms. Um, the thermal fluctuations end up causing some transient bonds at the interface. Uh, at zero Kelvin, those bonds don't exist. So, essentially, that creates. Uh, Optically active, optically active excitations. Um, oh yeah, since there aren't the bonds and therefore less coupling at zero Kelvin, then non-adiabatic electron transfer should be dominant at low temperatures. And again, because there is no uh, bond at the interface, you expect that you will not have these hybridized states as much. At zero right. Kelvin, as you see at uh, 300 Kelvin. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the vibrational modes modes end up, I guess, helping the charge transfer. They, um, yeah, I don't want to. You get the idea. <laughs> um, so, and here is a kind of give this analysis of. Uh, of these different bonds, and this is how it's written kind of in a more clear way. So it looks like you, they differentiate between iodine lead contribution to the frequencies, uh, uh, iodine lead bond versus titanium oxide bond, right? And I might be wrong, but it sounds like these titanium oxide vibrations really contribute insignificantly to the to this charge transfer processes. Right. But iodine lead So what about this iodine lead? Does it contribute, or what is it? It was like Xelitron couples primi primarily to the low frequency vibration of uh, iodine lead right. uh, structure. So these are more so how it ends up relaxing down to my... So the last, uh, last word of this uh, bullet... Of the first one? Yes. And create non-adiabatic non coupling. So this... Uh, so it's really iodine lead contribution is main for the non-adiabatic... Uh, bond is responsible for forming non-adiabatic coupling, according to this bond. Hmm. And then they go on to claim that the... That since all of the electron transfer mechanisms that they were looking at lead to ultra-fast uh, charge transfer, that indicates that the, like the range of experimental time scales found for the charge transfer should be due to the uh, exciton diffusion in the perovskite rather than any interfacial dynamics. And I don't understand why they make that claim, I guess. <laughs> that doesn't really make any sense to me, because they only look at one particular interface, and they don't really look at any sort of charge diffusion within the perovskite, so I'm not really sure where that's coming from. What range? The keyword is broad range. Right, yeah, yeah. They're saying that the broad range comes from that. So the um, distribution variation of the experimental reported rates of transfer can be explained by blaming the different diffusion. Right, but I feel like in experiments the the actual interface is probably going to appear very differently between different experimental setups. You know, there's probably going to be different spacing, like vertically or kind of within the titanium so dioxide. You, you wouldn't agree to this uh, conclusion? No, I, I do not agree with this one. Though. Obviously, controversial statement. Yeah. Is it? I don't know. It just seems like they kind of at the very end say, "Oh, it's no, just no, perhaps guys in charge." Yeah, this is a, this so is a final end. conclusion. Right. Yeah. So looks like again, if you were a reviewer for this paper, right? So you definitely would kind of. Um, I'll say, uh, would ask for for kind of explaining and maybe provide more discussion on this last. Well, right, yeah, because this is literally all that they say about that. I mean, it's okay, so you kind of disagree that the results which they show really allows to do this uh, conclusion 
or not really enough probably to do this con to make this conclusion. Well, I'm not a professional by any means. Well, so like, at least maybe this they, is how you feel. You right? know, and I just don't point? understand how. But I, yeah, I, I do not see. You how don't that's see a, a proof, valid claim. A kind of yeah. clear proof that yeah, whatever they see can be easily connected to those last phrases about right. experiment diffusion and so on. Do you see, again, suppose you're a reviewer for this paper, uh, do you see any other problems with a model to really make very, how to say, strong conclusions about this charge transfer state or direct uh, charge transfer state and so on? Well, they only looked at one model, I guess. So it's kind of difficult to make any general statements. But you know, when they do dynamics and yeah. when they average over 500 ensembles, it means that you really have 500, 500 Confirmations okay, with yeah. slightly different interface. Like, yeah, they consider only this interface in a sense of uh, symmetry of the surfaces, like whatever it is, one zero zero, whatever the surface they consider. But technically, they do it at room temperature, average over five hundred configurations. So it means their geometry really not exactly as it is at zero Kelvin. So they kind of have some different types of ensembles, some kind of distribution of the geometrical parameters for this surface versus that surface. I mean, the surface is fixed, but geometrical features, of course, are changing upon, uh, during the dynamics. But what do you think about the size of the system? Uh, the perovskite is way too thin. I and guess. what about titanium dioxide? That, it's probably even thinner than the perovskite. <laughs> The model that they show, the perovskite is literally one layer. And, and titanium is the same, or maybe two layers. Well, how it many goes off the edge of the screen. How many so atomic layers they have on the titanium dioxide? Along the direction. Because it, it, it Along cuts the off charge transfer they, direction. Yeah. Um, also, two, two layers, two probably. Layers, yeah. Two layers. What, right? Because, and then they have a vacuum. So, technically, what they have, they have a huge confinement along the direction. Mm -hmm. right? You really have in less than, probably, it's about, I don't know what's the size. What is a two-layer size? It's probably less than one nanometer. The you know the typical size of the uh, unit cell in perovskite, which is like six uh, angstrom. So, uh, the so it's less than one nanometer. Yes. yes. And then for, titan and for titanium, two it's layers so of just titanium. Just moving on the figure, it's also less than one nanometer. So technically, you're looking on the films, or I don't know, it's not really films; it's rods, probably. No, no, one nanometer. films, 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 oh. because they're flat. They're flat. Okay. It's flat. Films of one nanometer thickness. So you have a huge confinement applied. Almost like graphene. Al yeah, mm. along the uh, Z axis. Right. So then what kind of thing, like again, all these hybridization things, how do you think might be related to this extremely strong confinement? How well, confinement I mean, will affect localization, delocalization of these electronic states, electrons density? What do you think? I mean, it would probably strengthen the local, like the localization on like one particular system. I guess. Do you think it will really increase localization? I think yes. I'm not okay. really sure. Okay, particle in a box. Yeah. With a finite box. Okay. Huge box. Okay. But finite means what happens with your wave function in oh, a finite box? Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll. And you freak out it. as you contract it. What happens with the ages? If you with make the, it what? narrow, 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 if you decrease the size of your box mm -hmm. without changing the height of your box. Uh, it's a finite box, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens with your ages? Like, first of all, your wave function will have exponentially tails outside mm -hmm. the box, right? Right. And then if your box is becoming smaller and smaller, you will have larger and larger tails. You will have a larger portion of uh, of the wave function penetrating through the barrier, tunneling through the barrier. Okay. So means yeah. confinement actually will force your wave function being tunneling it from 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 the sides of your system. Okay. Yeah. yeah. From your potential. So it's actually increased hybridization. Okay. And those hybridized states, uh, they claim that this is because of the formation iodine. Uh, titanium bond might be a reason, but there yeah. is might be maybe the confinement effect probably plays much bigger role. Okay, yeah, that. And they're not showing their ground state orbitals like at zero Kelvin, I guess. 
Yeah, the only orbitals to prove, they show are like, the, if they show a zero Kelvin that they have, like, they say that at zero Kelvin there's no such bonds, but they don't show what really is their orbitals, or same orbitals which they show in here for this hybridized state, how these orbitals look at zero Kelvin. Are they really localized, or, or probably they already, I'm pretty sure, you, they will not have localized state even also at zero Kelvin. Also, the increase of the gap due to quantum confinement can contribute to cancellation of errors and giving the gaps in the right way. So yeah. if they would have a thicker with PBE, it would probably underestimate the gap. Okay. But the quantum confinement pushes Opens it back to okay. whatever is uh, experimental value. But again, uh, the, uh, with the gaps, again, it's not maybe a big deal, but this confinement picture might completely change their overall conclusions. So means if they will take a larger slabs, maybe four atomic layers, five atomic layers, at least for titanium, mm -hmm. they might not see charge transfer states at all, initial, I mean, from the initial either. They will have pure perovskite, pure, and then all these dynamics, all these contributions will be completely different, right? Can you, can you go to the uh, model, or orbitals, whatever? The orbitals? Or whatever, the whatever, something that's... This one. This is fine. So uh, you see that the perovskite is count, kind of bent, mm -hmm. and if you see maybe at zero, well, let's... Um, Actually, it's unclear. Is it zero Kelvin or it's a... No, no, it's this temperature. This is temperature. Oh, yeah. At okay. zero Kelvin, it is, it is more straight, but um, there is a mismatch between uh, thermal expansion and mm -hmm. lattice period mm -hmm. of these two crystals. So, like, they put which, too much constraint. Which will create a lot of strain. Which will, uh, if it will be such amount of strain in a realistic sample, it will just crack the sample. Okay. And all okay, the or something. Like, if they put it all cation in the same alignment, mm -hmm. if we look on the previous figure, it's very visible. So that charge can change the dipole moment and everything. Maybe. Um, what do you do? How do you treat the uh, strain in uh, your calculations. Do you have any strain? I know that. I, I know too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any significant strain as far as I'm Correct. aware. Correct. But why? why? Uh, what is different in your system comparing to this one? I have quantum dots that are like isolated, I guess, so it's not like. You know, so your periodic like boundary conditions not really dictating the, uh, the, the, the actual. Ge geometry of your system. So right? periodicity of the box is uh, selected to match uh, titanium. Titanium, not titanium. Oh. Uh, perovskite. Oh, oh, oh. So is titanium dioxide is a quantum. And titanium dioxide is uh, a, a cluster, quantum dot. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it doesn't uh, affect the um, size of the box and doesn't create any strain. It is one of the reasons to choose geometry that you are pursuing to avoid possible errors due to strain. Okay. Yeah, the only strain that I'm aware of is like because of the interface itself, where it, you know, yeah. the it's much much like much pu you know, push in or pull out the uh, the perovskite. Mm -hmm. There was John's question actually. There's a, about the cation. Is there any reason that they put the cation in the same alignment, all cation? If you go to the previous. Image? Oh, the uh, I, I think that they just optimized like that. But why yeah. do um, as we know from or, um, Daniel mm -hmm. R Ramirez? One can expose different surfaces of perovskite, either cation uh, rich or lead uh, iodine rich. Or pristine. Yeah, yeah. W w why they select uh, this uh, cation, uh, methyl ammonium cation rich to the titanium dioxide? Okay. I guess I don't know why they would choose to do it. Or maybe if, if they if they completed both, why did they hidden uh, another one from, from the paper? I guess it would be less likely to form bonds. I would think. Yes, like maybe they, they already made a discovery that in this configuration there is a higher chance for this uh, lead to titanium to iodine bond that they report. And therefore, they, they believe that this one it will be more facilitating charge transfer. But m maybe there are some other, other reasons. Yes, in the paper, they said this, the other kind of configuration is not stable. Okay. That's oh, the reason okay. they only use this one. 
Though at least they have Oh, yeah, 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 they did actually. Yeah, it's right here. <laughs> yeah, so here they, they do see the uh, for, formation of uh, iodine to titanium bonds. And maybe it stabilizes and. Uh, and they have a reference to 37, they are in conflict. Okay. That I have a follow up question. Yeah. So, considering the model they are using, so can we still call it as a pass guy? Because it's the extremely thin, right? Uh, one more time. So, I, I guess I have some question about the, the model. How they build the atomic cell. Mm -hmm. So if they use extremely thin power sky, so does it look reasonable? Oh, like how, do they see any comparison to experiment? Is it really possible to have such a thin films in a real samples? Do they discuss anything like this? Yeah, uh, yeah. They never. I don't think they ever actually mentioned making it that thin experimentally in the paper. Like, I, if any of I, our works, you can maybe do it, but criticism like this. Like how you justify your model is too thin. We need to learn from this author's what to reply back. I guess we were lucky. No, no one asked. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have no idea how you would actually realistically make something that thin. It's clear that it is not very realistic. It is clear that uh, since they use dynamics and they have already like about 300 atoms, they just cannot ramp it mm -hmm. up bigger. But then uh, one needs to find solid justification for this extremely thin. Uh, Model. Because I said, like, if really the a reason, the main contribution to the delocalized uh, this uh, charge transfer, direct charge transfer states, uh, is really due to the confinement rather than mm -hmm. formation of bonds or anything, then you just go to the more realistic structures. This without confinement, this effect disappears, right? And all their conclusions becomes not really applicable. Right. Yeah. So, so that's in this specific case, kind of justification of this such thin film approach, and comparison direct comparison to experimental examples looks like it's really the weakest part of this paper, and reviewers were really probably didn't care or mm -hmm. like like somehow they were lucky <laughs> that reviewer were not really kind of focusing on this type of things because this is really a most kind of problematic part of this of this paper. How really we can trust? How can we really put the same analysis and the same conclusions to more realistic cases when the films are not seen? But on, on and, and maybe in the supplementals they show. Maybe no, I'm wrong. No, maybe, but yes, anyway, uh, like how, the how easiest way structure changes if they take one more layer. Yeah. Well, this is probably well for titanium. Yeah, for titanium it's probably not very hard oh, to do. Well, for perovskite it's harder because it's really big uh, cell. For titanium, adding an additional layer probably not a big deal. But I think one simple thing which they can do even without, and again maybe they don't do for reason, because because of really this problem with confinement. But again, if if you were a reviewer, right, probably very easy thing to ask them. Yeah, you can of course say or calculate with a seeker and, and see what happens. Not dynamics, only electronic structure. But at possible. least show. Like if the if this charge transfer states really happening how they claim due to this formation of bonds, which again happens only 300 Kelvin and doesn't take place at zero Kelvin, show the ground state orbitals at zero Kelvin. Show that they are localized and they don't have this hybridized character. And yeah. if they do, then for sure it's probably confinement rather than formation. Formation the bond is a second contribution, but the first one would be confinement. Yeah. Anyone has more curiosity? Had enough. <laughs> okay, let's uh, thank London once again. Please plan uh, to prepare your posters and have some version keep on the tape. Uh, keep, um, uh, keep create first draft of posters by coming Tuesday and uh, schedule. Uh, I'll close the rest. Okay. And uh, uh, schedule for presenting them will be distributed soon. So you'll be briefly showing the poster on the on the screen and guiding the audience through as a drill and as an <laughs> opportunity to generate feedback from the group to the author for improving the poster. Can we put 
Alisa and Ben the first, especially Ben, because they have yes. their poster actually yes. August third. Not for ACS, but for sure, this, uh, sure. But let's do them on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, if if anyone was given substantial comments and want to give them back to London, uh, it's uh, appreciated because he will be writing paper on the similar subject tomorrow. Yeah.